Preface of a Hundred Great Poems, Selected and Annotated by Richard James Cross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Preface A hundred years ago, when Scott, Byron, Shelley, Keats, Coleridge, and Wordsworth were in their prime, the lovers of books were more interested in new poetry than in any other form of literary production. Down to the middle of the last century, this interest survived, for the masterpieces of Tennyson and Browning were still coming from the press. Today we have no great poets. The reading public is mainly interested in novels, and it is to be feared that the rising generation will entirely lose the taste for poetry. It has seemed to me that one way towards resuscitating that most excellent taste would be to make an anthology of some of the best poems in the language. The Golden Treasury and the Oxford Book of Verse are excellent in their way, but they cover too wide a field to answer my purpose, and they include a good deal of poetry which is either second-rate or which in the course of years has lost its original flavor. I have limited my selection to a hundred poems because present-day readers prefer a small book to a large one, and for the same reason I have had to exclude many long but otherwise admirable poems. It is not to be expected that critics will ever agree as to the comparative merits of different poets, but the great majority of the poems in this volume have stood the severe test of time, and have assuredly won their way to the first rank. Two only will be new to most readers, because they are now out of print. That is, that of Dr. Simons at page 121, and that of Henry Sidgwick at page 221. But in my judgment, they are not unworthy of their companions. As to the notes, they are intended for readers who are not familiar with the poems, and I can only claim originality for the note on Herrick's Gather Ye Rosebuds, and for that on Macaulay's Jacobite's Epitaph. My acknowledgments are due to Messrs. Houghton, Mifflin, and Company, the authorized publishers of Longfellow and Lowell, for permission to use poems by those authors. R.J.C., October 1907. End of Preface Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare, read for LibriVox.org by Orlando Harris. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declined by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed but thy eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair thou owest nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest so long as men can breathe or eyes can see so long lives this and this gives life to thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 29 by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Orlando Harris. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate wishing me like to one more rich in hope feature like him like him with friends possess desiring this man's art and that man's scope with what i most enjoy contend at least yet in these thoughts myself almost despising happily i think on thee and then my state like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then i scorn to change my state with kings end of poem 
This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 30 by William Shakespeare, read for LibriVox.org by Orlando Harris. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought and with old woes knew well my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye and use to flow for precious friends hid in death's dateless night and weep afresh love's long since counseled woe and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances forgone and heavily from woe to woe till o'er the sad account of for bemoaned moan which I knew pay as if not paid before but if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 71 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org no longer mourn for me when I am dead. Then you shall hear the surely sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it for I love you so, that I, in your sweet thoughts, would be forgot, if thinking on me then should make you woe. Oh, if, I say, you look upon this verse, when I, perhaps, compounded am with clay, do not so much as my poor name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay, lest the wise world should look into your moan and mock you with me after I am gone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 87 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz Farewell, thou art too dear for my possessing, And like enough thou know'st thy estimate. The charter of thy worth gives thee releasing, My bonds in thee are all determinate. For how do I hold thee but by thy granting, And for that riches where is my deserving? The cause of this fair gift in me is wanting, And so my patent back again is swerving. Thyself thou gavest, thy own worth then not knowing, Or me to whom thou gavest it else mistaking. So thy great gift upon misprison growing Comes home again on better judgment making. Thus have I had thee as a dream doth flatter, in sleep a king, but waking no such matter. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 104 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by David Willis To me, fair friend, you never can be old, for as you were when first your eye I eyed, such seems your beauty still. Three winters cold have from the forest shook three summers pride, three beauteous springs to yellow autumn turned. In process of the seasons I have seen, three April perfumes in three hot Junes burned. Since first I saw you fresh, which yet are green. Ah. Yet doth beauty, 
like a dial hand, steal from his figure, and no pace perceived. So your sweet hue, which methinks still doth stand, hath motion, and mine eye may be deceived. For fear of which, hear this, thou age unbred, ere you were born was beauty's summer dead. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 106 by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams. Your book voice. When in the chronicle of wasted time I see descriptions of the fairest whites and beauty making beautiful old rhyme in praise of ladies dead and lovely nights then in the blazon of sweet beauty's best of hand of foot of lip of eye of brow i see their antique pen would have expressed even such a beauty as your master now so all their praises are but prophecies of this our time all you prefiguring and for they looked but with divining eyes they had not skill enough your worth to sing for we which now behold these present days have eyes to wonder but lack tongues to praise and a poem this recording is in the public domain Sonnet 109 by William Shakespeare, read for LibriVox.org by David Willis. Oh, never say that I was false of heart, though absence seemed my flame to qualify. As easy might I from myself depart as from my soul, which in thy breast doth lie. That is my home of love. If I have ranged like him that travels, I return again just to the time, not with the time exchanged, so that myself bring water for my stain. Never believe, though in my nature reigned, all frailties that besiege all kinds of blood, that it could be so preposterously be stained to leave for nothing all thy sum of good. For nothing this wide universe I call, save thou, my rose, in it, Thou art my all. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song from As You Like It by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me and tune his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat? Come hither, come hither, come hither. Here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather 
who doth ambition shun and loves to live in the sun seeking the food he eats and pleased with what he gets come hither come hither come hither here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather end of poem this recording is in the public domain Song from As You Like It, number two, by William Shakespeare, read for LibriVox.org by David Willis. Blow, blow, thou winter wind, thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. Thy tooth is not so keen, because thou art not seen. Although thy breath be rude, hey-ho, sing hey-ho unto the green holly. Most friendship is feigning, most loving mere folly. Then hey-ho, the holly, this life is most jolly. Freeze, freeze, thou bitter sky. Thou dost not bite so nigh as benefits forgot. Though thou the waters warp, thy sting is not so sharp as friend remembered not. Hey-ho, sing hey-ho unto the green holly. Most friendship is feigning, most loving mere folly. Then hey-ho, the holly, this life is most jolly. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. To his mistress, Elizabeth, Queen of Bohemia, by Sir Henry Wotton. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone You meaner beauties of the night That poorly satisfy our eyes More by your number than your light You common people of the skies What are you when the moon shall rise? You curious chanters of the wood That warble forth Dame Nature's lays thinking your passions understood by your weak accents watch your praise when philomel her voice shall raise you violets that first appear by your pure purple mantles known like the proud virgins of the year as if the spring were all your own what are you when the rose is blown so when my mistress shall be seen in form and beauty of her mind by virtue first then choice a queen tell me if she were not designed the eclipse and glory of her kind footnote elizabeth of bohemia was the daughter of king james the first End footnote End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Celia by Ben Johnson. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra. To Celia. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine, or leave a kiss but in the cup, and I'll not look for wine. The thirst that from the soul doth rise Doth ask a drink divine. But might I of Jove's nectar sup, I would not change for thine. I sent thee late a rosy wreath, Not so much honouring thee As giving it a hope that there It could not withered be. But thou thereon didst only breathe And sentest it back to me, Since when it grows and smells, I swear, not of itself, but thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Noble Nature by Ben Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Tim Duong It is not growing like a tree in bulk Doth make man better be, Or standing long in oak three hundred year, to fall a log at last, dry, bald, and sear. 
A lily of a day is fairer far in May. Although it fall and die that night, it was the plant and flower of light. In small proportions we just beauties see, and in short measures life may perfect be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Gifts of God by George Herbert. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. When God at first made man, having a glass of blessings standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contract into a span. So strength first made a way, then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made us stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure rest in the bottom lay for if i should said he bestow this jewel also on my creature he would adore my gifts instead of me and rest in nature not the god of nature so both should losers be yet let him keep the rest but keep them with repining restlessness let him be rich and weary that at least if goodness lead him not yet weariness may toss him to my breast end of poem this recording is in the public domain To Anthea by Robert Herrick Read for LibriVox.org by Lore Bid me to live, and I will live, thy Protestant to be. Or bid me love, and I will give a loving heart to thee. A heart as soft, a heart as kind, a heart as sound and free as in the whole world thou canst find that heart i'll give to thee bid that heart stay and it will stay to honor thy decree or bid it languish quite away and thou shalt do so for thee bid me to weep and i will weep while i have eyes to see and having none, yet will I keep a heart to weep for thee. Bid me despair, and I'll despair under that cypress tree. Or bid me die, and I will dare in death to die for thee. Thou art my life, my love, my heart, the very eyes of me and haste command of every part to live and die for thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Virgins by Robert Herrick Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Gather ye rosebuds while ye may Old time is still a flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer, but being spent the worse, and worst times still succeed the former. Then be not coy, but use your time, and while ye may, go marry, for having lost but once your prime, you may for ever tarry. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Song by Edmund Waller Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug Go, lovely rose, tell her that wastes her time and me That now she knows, when I resemble her to thee, How sweet and fair she seems to be. Tell her that's young, and shuns to have her graces spied, that, hadst thou sprung in deserts where no men abide, thou must have uncommended died. Small is the worth of beauty from the light retired. Bid her come forth, suffer herself to be desired, and not blush so to be admired. Then die, that she, the common fate of all things rare, may read in thee. How small a part of time they share, that are so wondrous sweet and fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Nightingale by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Niccolo Cataruzza O Nightingale, that on yon bloomy spray warblest at eve, when all the woods are still. Thou with fresh hope the lover's heart dost fill, while the jolly hours lead on propitious May. Thy liquid notes that close the eye of day first heard before the shallow cuckoo's bill portend success in love. O oh, if Jove's will have linked that amorous power to thy soft lay. Now timely sing, ere the rude bird of hate, Foretell my hopeless doom in some grove nigh, As thou, from year to year, hast sung too late, For my relief, yet hadst no reason why. Whether the muse or love call thee his mate, Both them I serve, and of their train am I. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On His Blindness by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Kerry Adams When I consider how my light is spent Ere half my days in this dark world and wide And that one talent which is death to hide, Lodged with me useless, Though my soul more bent, To serve therewith my Maker, And present my true account, Lest he returning chide, Doth God exact day labor, Light denied? I fondly ask, But patience, To prevent that murmur, Soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An epitaph on the admirable dramatic poet W. Shakespeare by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone What needs my Shakespeare for his honoured bones the labour of an age of piled stones or that his hallowed relic should be hid under a starry pointing pyramid dear son of memory great heir of fame what needs thou such weak witness of thy name thou in our wonder and astonishment hast built thyself a live-long monument for whilst to the shame of slow endeavouring art thy easy numbers flow and that each heart hath from the leaves of thy unvalued book 
those delphic lines with deep impression took then thou our fancy of itself bereaving dost make us marble with too much conceiving and so sepulchred in such pomp dost lie that kings for such a tomb would wish to die end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lysidas by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Lysidas, a lament for a friend drowned in his passage from Chester on the Irish Sea, 1637 Yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtles brown, with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude shatter your leaves before the mellowing year bitter complaint and sad occasion dear compels me to disturb your season due for lysidas is dead dead ere his prime young lysidas and hath not left his peer who would not sing for lysidas he knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme he must not float upon his watery beer unwept and welter to the parching wind without the meed of some melodious tear begin then sisters of the sacred well that from beneath the seat of jove doth spring begin and somewhat loudly sweep the string hence with denial vain and coy excuse so may some gentle muse with lucky words favour my destined urn and as he passes turn and bid fair peace be to my sable shroud for we were nursed upon the selfsame hill fed the same flock by fountain shade and rill together both ere the high lawns appeared under the opening eyelids of the morn we drove afield and both together heard what time the grey fly winds her sultry horn battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night oft till the star that rose at evening bright toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute tempered to the oaten flute rough satyrs danced and fawns with cloven heel from the glad sound would not be absent long and old demotis loved to hear our song but oh the heavy change now thou art gone now thou art gone and never must return thee shepherd thee the woods and the desert caves with wild thyme and the gadding vine o'ergrown and all their echoes mourn the willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays as killing as the canker to the rose or taint worm to the weanling herds that graze or frost to flowers that their gay wardrobe wear when first the white thorn blows such lysidas thy loss to shepherd's ear where were ye nymphs when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved lysidas for neither were ye playing on the steep where your old bards the famous druids lie nor on the shaggy top of mona high nor yet where diva spreads her wizard stream ah me i fondly dream had ye been there for what could that have done what could the muse herself that orpheus bore the muse herself for her enchanting son whom universal nature did lament when by the rout that made the hideous roar his gory visage down the stream was sent down the swift hebrus to the lesbian shore alas what boots it with incessant care to tend the homely slighted shepherd's trade and strictly meditate the thankless muse were it not better done as others use to sport with amaryllis in the shade or with the tangles of naira's hair fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise 
that last infirmity of noble mind, to scorn delights and live laborious days. But the fair guerdon, when we hope to find, and think to burst out into sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin-spun life. But not the praise, Phoebus replied, and touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor in a glistering foil set off to the world, nor in broad rumour lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove as he pronounces lastly on each deed, of so much fame in heaven, expect thy meed. O fountain Arethusa, and thou honoured flood, smooth-sliding Mincius, crowned with vocal reeds, that strain I heard was of a higher mood. But now my oat proceeds, and listens to the herald of the sea, that came in Neptune's plea. He asked the waves, and asked the felon winds, What hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain? And questioned every gust of rugged wings That blows from off each beaked promontory. They knew not of his story. And sage Hippotides their answer brings, That not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm, and on the level brine, Sleek Panope with all her sisters played. It was that fatal and perfidious bark, built in the eclipse, and rigged with curses dark, that sunk so low that sacred head of thine. Next Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow, his mantle hairy, and his bonnet sedge inwrought with figures dim, and on the edge, like to that sanguine flower, inscribed with woe. Ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge. Last came, and last did go, the pilot of the Galilean lake. Two massy keys he bore, of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks, and stern bespake, How well could I have spared for thee, young swain, and now of such as, for their bellies' sake, creep and intrude, and climb into the fold. Of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest. Blind mouths, that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep hook, or have learned aught else the least that to the faithful herdsman's art belongs. What wrecks it them? What need they? They are sped, and when they list, their lean and flashy songs grate on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw. The hungry sheep look up, and are not fed, but, swollen with wind, and the rank mist they draw, rot inwardly, and foul contagion spread. Besides what the grim wolf, with privy paw, daily devours apace, and nothing said. But that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once, and smite no more. Return, Alpheus, the dread voice is past that shrunk thy streams. Return, Sicilian muse, and call the vales, and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues. Ye valleys low, where the mild whispers use of shades, and wanton winds, and gushing brooks, on whose fresh lap the swart star sparely looks. Throw hither all your quaint enamelled eyes that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers. Bring the wraith primrose that forsaken dies, the tufted croto and pale jessamine, the white pink and the pansy freaked with jet, the glowing violet, the musk rose, and the well-attired woodbine, with cowslips wan that hang the pensive head, and every flower that sad embroidery wears. Bid Amaranthus all his beauty shed, and daffodillies fill their cups with tears, to strew the laureate hearse where Lysid lies. 
For so, to interpose a little ease, let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise. Ah me, whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away, where'er thy bones are hurled, whether beyond the stormy Hebrides, where thou, perhaps under the whelming tide, visitst the bottom of the monstrous world, or whether thou, to our moist vows denied, sleep'st by the fable of Bolerus old, where the great vision of the guarded mount looks towards Namancos and Bayona's hold. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with ruth, and, O ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, for Lysidus, your sorrow, is not dead, sunk though he be beneath the watery floor. So sinks the day-star in the ocean bed, and yet anon repairs his drooping head, and tricks his beams, and, with new-spangled oar, flames in the forehead of the morning sky. So Lysidus, sunk low, but mounted high, through the dear might of him that walked the waves, where, other groves and other streams along, with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves, and hears the unexpressive nuptial song in the blessed kingdoms meek of joy and love. There entertain him, all the saints above, in solemn troops and sweet societies, that sing and singing in their glory move, and wipe the tears for ever from his eyes. Now, Lysidus, the shepherds weep no more. Henceforth thou art the genius of the shore in thy large recompense, and shalt be good to all that wander in that perilous flood. Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals grey. He touched the tender stops of various quills, with eager thought warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills, and now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose, and twitched his mantle blue, to-morrow to fresh woods and pastures new. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elegy written in a country churchyard by Thomas Gray, read for LibriVox.org by caveat. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leads the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air a solemn stillness holds. Save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, And drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Save that from yonder ivy-mantled tower The moping owl does to the moon complain, Of such as, wandering near her secret bower, Molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath those rugged elms that yew trees shade, Where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap, each in his narrow cell forever laid, the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. The breezy call of incense breathing morn, the swallow twittering from the straw-built shed, the cock's shrill clarion or the echoing horn, no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed. For them no more the blazing hearth shall burn, or busy housewife ply her evening care, no children run to lisp their sire's return, or climb his knees the envied kiss to share. Oft did the harvest to their sickle yield, their furrow oft the stubborn glebe has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield, how bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, all that beauty, all that welfare gave, 
a way to like the inevitable hour. The powers of glory lead but to the grave. Nor ye, nor you, ye proud, impute to these the fault, if memory o'er the tomb no trophies rise, where through the long-drawn aisle and fretted vault the pealing anthem swells the note of praise. Can storied urn or animated bust back to its mansion call the fleeting breath? Can honour's voice provoke the silent dust, or flattery soothe the dull, cold ear of death? Perhaps in this neglected spot is laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire, hands that the rod of empire might have swayed, or walked to ecstasy the living lyre. But knowledge to their eyes, her ample page, rich with the spoils of time, did ne'er unroll. Chill penury repossessed their noble rage, and froze the genial current of the soul. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark, unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Some village Hampton that, with doubtless breast, the little tyrant of his fields withstood. Some mute, inglorious Milton here may rest, some Cromwell, guiltless of his country's blood. The applause of listening senates to command the threats of pain and ruin to despise, to scatter plenty o'er a smiling land, and read their history in a nation's eyes. Their lot forbade, nor circumcised alone, their growing virtues but their crimes confined forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne, and shut the gates of mercy on mankind. The struggling pangs of conscience truth to hide, to quench the blushes of an ingenious shame, or heap the shrine of luxury and pride, with incense kindled at a muse's flame. Far from the madding crowd, ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learned to stray. Along the cool, sequestered vale of life, they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. Yet even these bones from insult to protect, some frail memorial still erected nigh, with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. Their name, their years, spelt by the unlettered muse, the place of fame and elegy supply, and many a holy text around she strews that teach the rustic moralist to die. For whom to dumb forgetfulness a prey, this pleasing, anxious being e'er resigned, left the warm precincts of the cheerful day, nor cast one longing, lingering look behind. On some fond breast the parting soul relies, some pious drops the closing eye requires. Even from the tomb the voice of nature cries, even in our ashes live their wanton fires. For thee, who mindful of the honoured dead, Dost in these lines their artless tale relate? If chance, by lonely contemplation led, Some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate. Haply some hoary-headed swain may say, Oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn, Brushing with hasty steps the dews away, To meet the sun upon the upland lawn. There at the foot of yonder nodding beech, That wreathes its old fantastic roots so high, his listless length at noontime would be stretch, and pour upon the brook that babbles by. Hark by yon wood, now smiling as in scorn, muttering his wayward fancies he would rove. Now drooping, woeful wan, like one forlorn, or crazed with care, or crossed in hopeless love. One morn I missed him on the customed hill, along the heath and near his favourite tree. Another came, nor yet beside the rill, nor at the lawn, nor at the wood was he. The next, with dirges due in sad array, slow through the churchway path we saw him borne, approach and read, for thou canst read, the lay, engraved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn. The Epitaph Here rests his head upon the lap of earth, a youth to fortune and to fame unknown. Fair science frowned not on his humble birth, and melancholy marked him for her own. Large was his bounty and his soul sincere. Heaven did a recompense as largely send. He gave to misery all he had 
a tear. He gained from heaven, t'was all he wished, a friend. No further seek his merits to disclose, or draw his frailties from their dread abode. There they alike in trembling hope repose, the bosom of his father and his God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines from the Vicar of Wakefield by Oliver Goldsmith Read for LibriVox.org by Lore When lovely woman stoops to folly And finds too late that men betray, What charm can soothe her melancholy? What art can wash her guilt away? The only art her guilt to cover, to hide her shame from every eye, to give repentance to her lover and wring his bosom is to die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Banks of Dune by Robbie Burns Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Ye banks and braes o' bonny doon How can ye bleem so fresh and fair? How can ye chant ye little birds And I say weary full o' care? Thou break my heart, thou warbling bird That wantons through the flowering thorn Thou minds me, O oh, departed joys, Departed never to return. Thou break my heart, thou bonny bird, That sings beside thy mate. For say I sat, and say I sang, And wist no oh, my fate. Oft hey I rove by bonny doon to see the rose and woodbine twine, and ilka bird sang o oh, its love, and fondly say did I o oh, mine. We light some heart I poured a rose full sweet upon its thorny tree. And my false lover stole my rose. But ah, he left the thorn with me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Robert Burns. Read for LibriVox.org by Kerry Adams. My love is like a red, red rose. That's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody That's sweetly played in tune. As there thou art, my bonny lass, So deep in love am I, And I will love thee still, my dear, Till a' the seas can dry. Till a' the seas can dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fair thee will, my only love, and fair thee will a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand mile. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Boutros Sonnet composed upon Westminster Bridge, September 3rd, 1802 Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by, A sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear, The beauty of the morning, silent, bare. 
ships towers domes theatres and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky all bright and glittering in the smokeless air never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour valley rock or hill ne'er saw i never felt a calm so deep the river glideth at his own sweet will dear god the very houses seem asleep and all that mighty heart is lying still end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sonnet by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Smithies The world is too much with us, late and soon, Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours, We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, The winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Smithies Most sweet it is, with unuplifted eyes, To pace the ground, if path be there or none, While a fair region round the traveller lies, Which he forbears again to look upon, Pleased rather with some soft ideal scene, the work of fancy, or some happy tone of meditation, slipping in between the beauty coming and the beauty gone. If thought and love desert us, from that day let us break off all commerce with the muse. With thought and love companions of our way, whate'er the senses take or may refuse, the mind's internal heaven shall shed her dews of inspiration on the humblest lay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay ten thousand saw i at a glance tossing their heads in sprightly dance the waves beside them danced but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee a poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company i gazed and gazed but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought for oft when on my couch i lie in vacant or in pensive mood they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Skylark by William Wordsworth. Read for LibriVox.org by Shefali. 
Ethereal minstrel, pilgrim of the sky, dost thou despise the earth where cares abound? Or while the wings aspire our heart and eye, both with thy nest upon the dewy ground, thy nest which thou canst drop into at will, those quivering wings composed that music still, to the last point of vision and beyond, mount daring warbler, that love-prompted strain, twixt thee and thine a never-failing bond, thrills not the less the bosom of the plain. Yet mightst thou seem, proud privilege, to sing all independent of the leafy spring. Leave to the nightingale her shady wood, a privacy of glorious light is thine. Whence thou dost pour upon the world a flood of harmony, with instinct more divine, type of the wise who soar, but never roam, true to the kindred points of heaven and home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on the Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Boutros There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, The earth and every common sight, To me did seem apparelled in celestial light, The glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore, Turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen I now can see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare. Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The sunshine is a glorious birth, but yet I know, where'er I go, that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. Now while the birds thus sing a joyous song, And while the young lambs bound as to the tabers sound, To me alone there came a thought of grief, A timely utterance gave that thought relief, And I again am strong. The cataracts blow their trumpets from the steep, No more shall grief of mine the season wrong, I hear the echoes through the mountains throng, the winds come to me from the fields of sleep and all the earth is gay land and sea give themselves up to jollity and with the heart of may doth every beast keep holiday thou child of joy shout round me let me hear thy shouts thy happy shepherd boy ye blessed creatures i have heard the call ye to each other make i see the heavens laugh with you in your jubilee my heart is at your festival my head hath its coronal the fullness of your bliss i feel i feel it all o oh, evil day if i were sullen while earth herself is adorning this sweet may morning and the children are culling on every side in a thousand valleys far and wide fresh flowers while the sun shines warm and the babe leaps up on his mother's arm i hear i hear with joy i hear but there is a tree of many one a single field which i have looked upon both of them speak of something that is gone the pansy at my feet doth the same tale repeat whither is fled the visionary gleam where is it now the glory and the dream our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, Hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, But trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, Who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy, Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy, but he beholds the light and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. The youth who daily farther from the east must travel, still is nature's priest, 
and by the vision splendid is on his way attended at length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day earth fills her lap with pleasures of her own yearnings she hath in her own natural kind and even with something of a mother's mind and no unworthy aim the homely nurse doth all she can to make her foster child her inmate man forget the glories he hath known and that imperial palace whence he came behold the child among his new-born blisses a six years darling of a pygmy size see where mid work of his own hand he lies fretted by sallies of his mother's kisses with light upon him from his father's eyes see at his feet some little plan or chart some fragment from his dream of human life shaped by himself with newly learned art a wedding or a festival a mourning or a funeral and this hath now his heart and unto this he frames his song then will he fit his tongue to dialogues of business love or strife but it will not be long ere this be thrown aside and with new joy and pride the little actor cons another part filling from time to time his humorous stage with all the persons down to palsied age that life brings with her in her equipage as if his whole vocation were endless imitation thou whose exterior semblance doth belie thy soul's immensity thou best philosopher who yet dost keep thy heritage thou eye among the blind that deaf and silent readest the eternal deep haunted for ever by the eternal mind mighty prophet seer blessed on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find in darkness lost the darkness of the grave thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a presence which is not to be put by thou little child yet glorious in the might of heaven-born freedom on thy being's height why with such earnest pains dost thou provoke the years to bring the inevitable yoke thus blindly with thy blessedness at strife full soon thy soul shall have her earthly freight and custom lie upon thee with a weight heavy as frost and deep almost as life o oh, joy that in our embers is something that doth live that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive the thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benediction not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed delight and liberty the simple creed of childhood whether busy or at rest with new-fledged hope still fluttering in his breast not for these i raise the song of thanks and praise but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things fallings from us vanishings blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised but for those first affections those shadowy recollections which be they what they may are yet the fountain light of all our day are yet a master light of all our seeing uphold us cherish and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence truths that wake to perish never which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour nor man nor boy nor all that is at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy hence in a season of calm weather though inland far we be our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in a moment travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore 
then sing ye birds sing sing a joyous song and let the young lambs bound as to the tabers sound we in thought will join your throng ye that pipe and ye that play ye that through your hearts to-day feel the gladness of the may what though the radiance which was once so bright be now for ever taken from my sight though nothing can bring back the hour of splendour in the grass of glory in the flower we will grieve not rather find strength in what remains behind in the primal sympathy which having been must ever be in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering in the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic mind and oh ye fountains meadows hills and groves forebode not any severing of our loves yet in my heart of hearts i feel your might i only have relinquished one delight to live beneath your more habitual sway i love the brooks which down their channels fret even more than when i tripped lightly as they the innocent brightness of a new-born day is lovely yet the clouds that gather round the setting sun do take a sober colouring from an eye that hath kept watch o'er man's mortality another race hath been and other palms are won thanks to the human heart by which we live thanks to its tenderness its joys and fears to me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. End of Ode on the Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood This recording is in the public domain. Yarrow Visited by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Smithies. And is this Yarrow? This the stream of which my fancy cherished so faithfully? A waking dream, an image that hath perished? Oh, that some minstrel's harp were near to utter notes of gladness and chase this silence from the air that fills my heart with sadness. Yet why? A silvery current flows with uncontrolled meanderings. Nor have these eyes by greener hills been soothed in all my wanderings. And, through her depths, St Mary's Lake is visibly delighted, for not a feature of those hills is in the mirror slighted. A blue sky bends o'er yarrow vale, save where that pearly whiteness is round the rising sun diffused, a tender, hazy brightness, mild dawn of promise that excludes all profitless dejection, though not unwilling here to admit a pensive recollection. Where was it that the famous flower of Yarrow Vale lay bleeding? His bed, perchance, was yon smooth mound on which the herd is feeding, and haply from this crystal pool, now peaceful as the morning, the water wraith ascended thrice and gave his doleful warning. Delicious is the lay that sings the haunts of happy lovers, the path that leads them to the grove, the leafy grove that covers. And pity sanctifies the verse that paints, by strength of sorrow, the unconquerable strength of love. Bear witness, rueful Yarrow. But thou that didst appear so fair to fond imagination, dost rival in the light of day her delicate creation. Meek loveliness is round thee spread, a softness still and holy. The grace of forest charms decayed, and pastoral melancholy. That region left, the vale unfolds rich groves of lofty stature, with yarrow winding through the pomp of cultivated nature. And rising from those lofty groves, behold a ruin hoary, the shattered front of Newark's towers, renowned in border story. Fair scenes for childhood's opening bloom, for sportive youth to stray in, for manhood to enjoy his strength, and age to wear away in. 
Yon cottage seems a bower of bliss, a covert for protection of tender thoughts that nestle there, the brood of chaste affection. How sweet, on this autumnal day, the wildwood fruits to gather, and on my true love's forehead plant a crest of blooming heather. And what if I enwreathed my own, to a no offence to reason? The sober hills thus deck their brows to meet the wintry season. I see, but not by sight alone. Loved Yarrow, have I won thee? A ray of fancy still survives, her sunshine plays upon thee. Thy ever youthful waters keep a course of lively pleasure, and gladsome notes my lips can breathe accordant to the measure. The vapours linger round the heights, they melt and soon must vanish. One hour is theirs, nor more is mine, sad thought, which I would banish, but that I know where'er I go, thy genuine image, Yarrow, will dwell with me to heighten joy and cheer my mind in sorrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Catullian Hendecasyllables by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Here, my beloved, an old Milesian story. High and embosomed in congregated laurels glimmered a temple upon a breezy headland. In the dim distance, amid the skyey billows, rose a fair island. The god of flocks had placed it. From the far shores of the bleak resounding island, oft by the moonlight a little boat came floating, came to the sea cave beneath the breezy headland, where amid myrtles a pathway stole in mazes up to the groves of the high embosomed temple there in a thicket of dedicated roses oft did a priestess as lovely as a vision pouring her soul to the son of cytheria pray him to hover around the slight canoe boat and with invisible pilotage to guide it over the dusk wave until the nightly sailor shivering with ecstasy sank upon her bosom end of poem this recording is in the public domain youth and age by s t coolridge read for librivox dot org by krista zaleski verse a breeze mid blossom straying where hope clung feeding like a bee both were mine, life went a maying, with nature, hope, and posy, when I was young. When I was young, ah, woeful when, ah, for the change twixt now and then, this breathing house not built with hands, this body that does me grievous wrong, or airy cliffs and glittering sands, how lightly then it flashed along, like those trim skiffs unknown of yore, unwinding lakes and rivers wide that ask no aid of sail or oar, that fear no spite of wind or tide. Not cared this body for wind or weather, when youth and I lived in together. Flowers are lovely, love is flower-like, friendship is a sheltering tree. Oh, the joys that came down shower-like, of friendship, love, and liberty, ere I was old. Ere I was old? Ah, woeful ere! which tells me youth's no longer here. O oh, youth, for years so many and sweet, tis known that thou and I were one. I'll think it but a fond conceit, it cannot be that thou art gone. Thy vesper bell hath not yet tolled, and thou wert I a masker bold. What strange disguise hast now put on, to make believe that thou art gone? I see these locks in silvery slips, this drooping gait, this altered size, but springtide blossoms on thy lips, and tears take sunshine from thine eyes. Life is but thought, 
so think I will, that youth and I are housemates still. Dewdrops are the gems of morning, but the tears of mournful eve, where no hope is life so warning, that only serves to make us grieve when we are old, that only serves to make us grieve with oft and tedious taking leave, like some poor nigh-related guest that may not rudely be dismissed, yet hath outstayed his welcome while and tells the jest without the smile. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Buchos In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery but oh that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover a savage place as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover and from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing a mighty fountain momently was forced amid whose swift half intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river five miles meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale the sacred river ran then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean and mid this tumult kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war the shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once i saw it was an abyssinian maid and on her dulcimer she played singing of mount abora could i revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight twould win me that with music loud and long i would build that dome in air that sunny dome those caves of ice and all who heard should see them there and all should cry beware beware his flashing eyes his floating hair weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread for he on honey-dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Genevieve by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Davis Genevieve All thoughts, all passions, all delights, Whatever stirs this mortal frame, All are but ministers of love, and feed his sacred flame. Oft in my waking dreams do I live o'er again that happy hour when midway on the mount I lay beside the ruined tower. The moonshine stealing o'er the scene had blended with the lights of eve, and she was there, my hope, my joy, my own dear Genevieve. She leaned against the armed man, the statue of the armed knight. She stood and listened to my lay amid the lingering light. 
Few sorrows hath she of her own. My hope, my joy, my Genevieve. She loves me best whene'er I sing the songs that make her grieve. I played a soft and doleful air. I sang an old and moving story, an old rude song that suited well, that ruin wild and hoary. She listened with a flitting blush, with downcast eyes and modest grace, for well she knew I could not choose but gaze upon her face. I told her of the night that wore upon his shield a burning brand, and then for ten long years he wooed the lady of the land. I told her how he pined, and ah, the deep, the low, the pleading tone with which I sang another's love, interpreted my own. She listened with a flitting blush, with downcast eyes and modest grace, and she forgave me that I gazed too fondly on her face. When she I told the cruel scorn that crazed that bold and lovely knight, and that he crossed the mountain woods, nor rested day nor night, that sometimes from the savage den, and sometimes from the darksome shade, and sometimes starting up at once in green and sunny glade. There came and looked him in the face, an angel beautiful and bright, and that he knew it was a fiend, this miserable night. And that unknowing what he did, he leaped amid a murderous band, and saved from outrage worse than death, the lady of the land. And how she wept and clasped his knees, and how she tended him in vain, and ever strove to expiate the scorn that crazed his brain. And that she nursed him in a cave, and how his madness went away, when on the yellow forest leaves a dying man he lay. His dying words, but when I reached that tenderest strain of all the ditty, my faltering voice and pausing harp disturbed her soul with pity. All impulses of soul and sense had thrilled my guileless Genevieve. The music and the doleful tale, the rich and balmy eve, and hopes and fears that kindle hope an undistinguishable throng, and gentle wishes long subdued, subdued and cherished long. She wept with pity and delight, she blushed with love and virgin shame, and like the murmur of a dream I heard her breathe my name. Her bosom heaved, she stepped aside, as conscious of my look she stepped, then suddenly, with timorous eye, she fled to me and wept. She half enclosed me with her arms. She pressed me with a meek embrace, and bending back her head looked up and gazed upon my face. T'was partly love and partly fear, and partly t'was a bashful art, that I might rather feel than see the swelling of her heart. I calmed her fears, and she was calm, and told her love with virgin pride, and so I won my Genevieve, my bright and beauteous bride. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Old Familiar Faces by Charles Lamb Read for LibriVox.org by Ali Rose I have had playmates, I have had companions In my days of childhood, in my joyful school days All, all are gone, the old familiar faces 
I have been laughing, I have been carousing, drinking late, sitting late with my bosom cronies. All, all are gone, the old familiar faces. I loved a love once, fairest among women, closed are her doors on me, I must not see her, all, all are gone, the old familiar faces. I have a friend, a kind of friend, has no man, like an ingrate I left my friend abruptly, left him to muse on the old familiar faces. Ghost-like I paced round the haunts of my childhood, earth seemed a desert I was bound to traverse, seeking to find the old familiar faces. Friend of my bosom, thou more than a brother, why wert not thou born in my father's dwelling, so might we talk of the old familiar faces? How some have died, and some they have left me, and some are taken from me, all are departed. All, all are gone, the old familiar faces. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hester by Charles Lamb. Read for LibriVox.org by Ali Rose. When maidens such as Hester die, their place ye may not well supply, though ye among a thousand try with vain endeavour. A month or more hath she been dead, yet cannot I by force be led to think upon the wormy bed and her together. A springy motion in her gait, a rising step did indicate, of pride and joy no common rate that flushed her spirit. I know not by what name beside I shall it call if twas not pride, it was a joy to that allied she did inherit. Her parents held the Quaker rule, which doth the human feeling cool, but she was trained in nature's school, nature had blessed her. A waking eye, a prying mind, a heart that stirs is hard to bind, a hawk's keen sight ye cannot blind, ye could not hester. My sprightly neighbour, gone before, to know that unknown and silent shore, shall we not meet as heretofore some summer morning, when from thy cheerful eyes a ray hath struck the bliss upon the day a bliss that would not go away a sweet forewarning end of poem this recording is in the public domain oft in the stilly night by thomas moore read for LibriVox.org by sandra Oft in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, fond memory brings the light of other days around me, the smiles, the tears of boyhood's years, the words of love then spoken, the eyes that shone, now dimmed and gone, the cheerful hearts, now broken. Thus, in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me, when I remember all the friends so linked together I've seen around me fall, like leaves in wintry weather, I feel like one who treads alone, some banquet hall deserted, whose lights are fled, whose garlands dead, and all but he departed. Thus in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Address to the Mummy by Horace Smith Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk And thou hast walked about, how strange a story, In Thebes' streets three thousand years ago, When the Memnonium was in all its glory, And time had not begun to overthrow Those temples, palaces, and piles stupendous, of which the very ruins are tremendous. Speak, for thou long enough hast acted dummy. Thou hast a tongue. Come, let us hear its tune. 
thou'rt standing on thy legs above ground mummy revisiting the glimpses of the moon not like thin ghosts or disembodied creatures but with thy bones and flesh and limbs and features tell us for doubtless thou canst recollect to whom should we assign the sphinx's fame was cheops or cephrenes architect of either pyramid that bears his name is pompey's pillar really a misnomer had thebes a hundred gates as sung by homer perhaps thou wert a mason and forbidden by oath to tell the secrets of thy trade then say what secret melody was hidden in memnon's statue which at sunrise played perhaps thou wert a priest if so my struggles are vain for priestcraft never owns its juggles perhaps that very hand now pinioned flat has hobnobbed with pharaoh glass to glass or dropped a halfpenny in homer's hat or doffed thine own to let queen dido pass or held by solomon's own invitation a torch at the great temple's dedication i need not ask thee if that hand when armed has any roman soldier mauled and knuckled for thou wert dead and buried and embalmed ere romulus and remus had been suckled antiquity appears to have begun long after thy primeval race was run thou couldst develop if that withered tongue might tell us what those sightless orbs have seen how the world looked when it was fresh and young and the great deluge still had left it green or was it then so old that history's pages contained no record of its early ages still silent incommunicative elf art sworn to secrecy then keep thy vows but prithee tell us something of thyself reveal the secrets of thy prison house since in the world of spirits thou hast slumbered what hast thou seen what strange adventures numbered since first thy form was in this box extended we have above ground seen some strange mutations the roman empire has begun and ended new worlds have risen we have lost old nations and countless kings have into dust been humbled while not a fragment of thy flesh has crumbled didst thou not hear the pother o'er thy head when the great persian conqueror cambyses marched armies o'er thy tomb with thundering tread or through osiris horus apis isis and shook the pyramids with fear and wonder when the gigantic memnon fell asunder if the tomb secrets may not be confessed the nature of thy private life unfold a heart has throbbed beneath that leathern breast and tears adown that dusty cheek have rolled have children climbed those knees and kissed that face what was thy name and station age and race statue of flesh immortal of the dead imperishable type of evanescence posthumous man who quits thy narrow bed and standest undecayed within our presence thou wilt hear nothing till the judgment morning when the great trump shall thrill thee with its warning why should this worthless tegument endure if its undying guest be lost for ever oh let us keep the soul embalmed and pure in living virtue that when both must sever although corruption may our frame consume the immortal spirit in the skies may bloom end of poem this recording is in the public domain a boo ben adam and the angel by j h leigh hunt read for LibriVox.org by sandra 
A boo Ben Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace, and saw within the moonlight in his room, making it rich and like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in a book of gold. Exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold, and to the presence in the room he said, What writest thou? The vision raised its head, and with a look made of all sweet accord, answered, The names of those who love the Lord. And is mine one? said Abu. Nay, not so, replied the angel. Abu spoke more low, but cheerily still, and said, I pray thee then, write me as one that loves his fellow men. The angel wrote and vanished. The next night it came again with a great wakening light and showed the names whom love of God had blessed. And lo, Ben Adam's name led all the rest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. From the Gyor by George Gordon Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone He who hath bent him o'er the dead, Ere the first day of death is fled, The first dark day of nothingness, The last of danger and distress, Before decay's effacing fingers Have swept the lines where beauty lingers, And marked the mild angelic air, the rapture of repose that's there, the fixed yet tender traits that streak, the languor of the pallid cheek, and, but for that sad shrouded eye that fires not, wins not, weeps not now, and but for that chill changeless brow where cold obstructions apathy appalls the gazing mourner's heart, as if to him it could impart the doom he dreads yet dwells upon yes but for these and these alone some moments ay one treacherous hour he still might doubt the tyrant's power so fair so calm so softly sealed the first last look of death revealed such is the aspect of this shore tis greece but living greece no more so coldly sweet, so deadly fair, We start, for soul is wanting there. Hers is the loveliness in death, That parts not quite with parting breath, But beauty with that fearful bloom, That hue which haunts it to the tomb, Expression's last receding ray, A gilded halo hovering round decay, The farewell beam of feeling passed away spark of that flame perchance of heavenly birth which gleams but warms no more its cherished earth end of poem this recording is in the public domain hebrew melodies by lord byron read for librivox dot org by lore she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies one shade the more one ray the less had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure how dear their dwelling place and on that cheek and o'er that brow so soft so calm yet eloquent the smiles that win the tints that glow but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
To a Skylark by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Paul Bagley Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it poured thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, o'er which clouds are brightening, thou dost float and run, like an embodied joy whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy flight, like a star of heaven in the broad daylight, Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, Whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear, Until we hardly see, we feel that it is there. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud, As when night is bare. From one lonely cloud the moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. What thou art we know not, what is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see, as from thy presence showers a rain of melody. Like a poet hidden in the light of thought, Singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought To sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not. Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower, Soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour With music sweet as love which overflows her bower. Like a glow-worm golden in a dell of dew, Scattering unbeholden its aerial hue, among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view. Like a rose embowered in its own green leaves, by warm winds deflowered, till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet these heavy winged thieves. Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, rain awakened flowers, all that ever was joyous and clear and fresh, Thy music doth surpass. Teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I have never heard praise of love or wine That panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus hymeneal or triumphal chaunt Matched with thine would be all but an empty vaunt a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains, what shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind, what ignorance of pain? With thy clear keen joyance languor cannot be, shadow of annoyance never came near thee, thou lovest, but ne'er knew love's sad satiety. Waking or asleep, thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream, or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? We look before and after, and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet if we could scorn, hate, and pride, and fear, If we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Better than all measures of delightful sound, Better than all treasures that in books are found, Thy skill to poet were, Thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then, 
as I am listening now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love's Philosophy by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz The fountains mingle with the river And the rivers with the ocean The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion Nothing in the world is single All things by a law divine In one spirit meet and mingle Why not I with thine? See the mountains kiss high heaven, and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet work worth, if thou kiss not me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines to an Indian Air by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Mike Davis Lines to an Indian Air I arise from dreams of thee In the first sweet sleep of night When the winds are breathing low And the stars are shining bright I arise from dreams of thee And a spirit in my feet has led me, who knows how, to thy chamber window, sweet. The wandering airs they faint, on the dark, the silent stream. The champak odors fail, like sweet thoughts in a dream. The nightingale's complaint, it dies upon her heart. And I must die on thine, O beloved, as thou art. O oh, lift me from the grass, I die, I faint, I fail. Let thy love in kisses rain on my lips and eyelids pale. My cheek is cold and white, alas, my heart beats loud and fast. O oh, press it close to thine again, where it will break at last. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet Ozymandias by Percy Biss Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear my name is ozymandias king of kings look on my works ye mighty and despair nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Two by Percy B. Shelley. Read for LibriVox.org. One word is too often profaned for me to profane it one feeling too falsely disdained for thee to disdain it one hope is too like despair for prudence to smother and pity from thee more dear than that from another 
I can give not what men call love. But wilt thou accept not the worship the heart lifts above, and the heavens reject not? The desire of the moth for the star, of the night for the morrow, the devotion to something afar from the sphere of our sorrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tonight by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Read for LibriVox.org by Paul Bagley. Swiftly walk o'er the western wave, spirit of night, out of the misty eastern cave, where, all the long and lone daylight, thou wovest dreams of joy and fear, which make thee terrible and dear, swift be thy flight. Wrap thy form in a mantle grey, star inwrought, blind with thine hair the eyes of day, kiss her, until she be wearied out, then wander o'er city and sea and land, touching all with thine opiate wand, come, long sought. When I arose and saw the dawn, I sighed for thee. When light rode high and the dew was gone, and noon lay heavy on flower and tree, and the weary day turned to his rest, Lingering like an unloved guest, I sighed for thee. Thy brother death came and cried, Wouldst thou me? Thy sweet child sleep, the filmy-eyed, Murmured like a noontide bee. Shall I nestle near thy side? Wouldst thou me? And I replied, No, not thee. Death will come when thou art dead, Soon, too soon. Sleep will come when thou art fled. Of neither would I ask the boon I ask of thee, beloved night. Swift be thine approaching flight. Come soon, soon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Moon by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Tim Zhuang Art thou pale for weariness of climbing heaven and gazing on the earth, wandering companionless among the stars that have a different birth, and ever changing like a joyless eye that finds no object worth its constancy? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Percy Shelley. Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Smithies. Rarely, rarely comest thou, spirit of delight. Wherefore hast thou left me now many a day and night? Many a weary night and day tis since thou art fled away. How shall ever one like me win thee back again? With the joyous and the free thou wilt scoff at pain. Spirit false, thou hast forgot all but those who need thee not. As a lizard with the shade of a trembling leaf, thou with sorrow art dismayed. Even the sighs of grief reproach thee that thou art not near and reproach thou wilt not hear. Let me set my mournful ditty to a merry measure. Thou wilt never come for pity, thou wilt come for pleasure. Pity, then, will cut away those cruel wings, and thou wilt stay. I love all that thou lovest, spirit of delight, the fresh earth in new leaves dressed, and the starry night, autumn evening, and the morn when the golden mists are born. I love snow and all the forms of the radiant frost. I love waves and winds and storms, 
everything almost which is nature's and may be untainted by man's misery. I love tranquil solitude and such society as is quiet, wise and good. Between thee and me, what difference? But thou dost possess the things I seek, not love them less. I love love, though he has wings and like light can flee. But above all other things, spirit, I love thee. Thou art love and life. Oh, come, make once more my heart thy home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvan historian, who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? What leaf fringe legends haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and tambrils? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but, more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss, for ever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, for ever piping songs, for ever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, for ever warm and still to be enjoyed, for ever panting and for ever young or breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue who are these coming to the sacrifice to what green altar o mysterious priest leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed what little town by river or seashore, or mountain built with peaceful citadel, is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And, little town, thy streets for evermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O Attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed. Thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain, in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
on first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams, your book voice. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demence. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez, when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high pilot books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone, and think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Stanzas by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug In a drear night of December, Too happy, happy tree, Thy branches ne'er remember their green felicity. The north cannot undo them, With a sleety whistle through them, nor frozen thawings glue them from budding at the prime. In a drear nighted December, too happy, happy brook, thy bubblings ne'er remember Apollo's summer look, but with a sweet forgetting, they stay their crystal fretting, never, never petting about the frozen time. Ah, would twere so with many a gentle girl and boy, but were there ever any writhed not at passed joy? To know the change and feel it, when there is none to heal it, nor numbered sense to steal it, was never said in rhyme. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. La Belle Dame Sans Merci by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, Alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, And no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, So haggard and so woebegone? The squirrel's granary is full, And the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, With anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant sewn. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish, sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew. 
and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses four. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed. Ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hill's side. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame, sans merci, hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide. And I woke and found me here, on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Buchos. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains, one minute past, and lethwards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot, of beechen green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth, oh for a beaker full of the warm south full of the true the blushful hippocrene with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth that i might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim fade far away dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known the weariness the fever and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-dyed despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond to-morrow away away for i will fly to thee not charioted by bacchus and his parts but on the viewless wings of poesy though the dull brain perplexes and retards already with thee tender is the night and haply the queen moon is on her throne clustered around by all her starry face but here there is no light save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways i cannot see what flowers are at my feet nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass the thicket and the fruit-tree wild white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine fast-fading violets covered up in leaves and mid-may's eldest child the coming musk-rose full of dewy wine the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves darkling i listen and for many a time i have been half in love with easeful death called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath now more than ever seems it rich to die to cease upon the midnight with no pain while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy still wouldst thou sing and i have ears in vain to thy high requiem become a sod 
Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairylands forlorn forlorn the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self adieu the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do deceiving elf adieu adieu thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows over the still stream up the hillside and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades was it a vision or a waking dream fled is that music do i wake or sleep end of poem this recording is in the public domain Last Sonnet by John Keats Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, Not in lone splendour hung aloft the night, And watching with eternal lids apart, Like nature's patient sleepless eremite, The moving waters at their priest-like task A pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new, soft-fallen mask of snow Upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, Pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, To feel for ever its soft fall and swell, Awake for ever in a sweet unrest, Still, still to hear her tender-taken breath, And so live ever, or else swoon to death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Song of the Shirt by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Rita Boutros. With fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman sat in unwomanly rags plying her needle and thread stitch 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 in poverty hunger and dirt and still with a voice of dolorous pitch she sang the song of the shirt work 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 while the cock is crowing aloof and work 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 till the stars shine through the roof it's oh to be a slave along with the barbarous turk where woman has never a soul to save if this is christian work 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 till the brain begins to swim work 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 till the eyes are heavy and dim seam and gusset and band band and gusset and seam till over the buttons i fall asleep and sew them on in a dream o oh, men with sisters dear o oh, men with mothers and wives it is not linen you're wearing out but human creatures lives stitch 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 in poverty hunger and dirt sewing at once with a double thread a shroud as well as a shirt but why do I talk of death, that phantom of grisly bone? I hardly fear his terrible shape, it seems so like my own. It seems so like my own, because of the fasts I keep. O oh God, that bread should be so dear, and flesh and blood so cheap. Work, 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 my labor never flags. And what are its wages, a bed of straw, a crust of bread and rags? That shattered roof, and this naked floor, a table, a broken chair, and a wall so blank, my shadow, I think, for sometimes falling there. 
Work, 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 from weary chime to chime. Work, 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 as prisoners work for crime. Band and gusset and seam, seam and gusset and band, till the heart is sick and the brain be numbed as well as the weary hand. Work, 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 in the dull December light, and work, 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 when the weather is warm and bright, while underneath the eaves the brooding swallows cling, as if to show me their sunny backs and twit me with the spring. Oh, but to breathe the breath of the cowslip and primrose sweet, with the sky above my head and the grass beneath my feet, for only one short hour to feel as I used to feel before I knew the woes of want and the walk that costs a meal. Oh, but for one short hour, a respite, however brief, no blessed leisure for love or hope, but only time for grief. A little weeping would ease my heart, but in their briny bed my tears must stop, for every drop hinders needle and thread. With fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman sat in unwomanly rags, plying her needle and thread. Stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger, and dirt, and still with a voice of dolorous pitch, would that its tone could reach the rich, she sang this song of the shirt. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Death Bed by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee We watched her breathing through the night, Her breathing soft and low, As in her breast the wave of life Kept heaving to and fro. So silently we seemed to speak, so slowly moved about as we had lent her half our powers to eke her living out our very hopes belied our fears our fears our hopes belied we thought her dying when she slept and sleeping when she died for when the morn came dim and sad and chill with early showers her quiet eyelids closed she had another morn than ours end of poem this recording is in the public domain a jacobite's epitaph by lord macaulay Read for LibriVox.org by Ali Rose To my true king I offered free from stain Courage and faith, vain faith and courage vain For him I threw lands, honours, wealth away And won dear hope that was more prized than they For him I languished in a foreign clime Grey-haired with sorrow in my manhood's prime Heard on Lavernia Scargill's whispering trees, And pined by Arno for my lovelier teas. Beheld each night my home in fevered sleep, Each morning started from the dream to weep, Till God who saw me tried too sorely, Gave the resting place I asked an early grave. O thou whom chance leads to this nameless stone, From that proud country which was once mine own, By those white cliffs I never more must see, By that dear language which I spake like thee, Forget all feuds and shed one English tear, O'er English dust a broken heart lies here. End of recording. This recording is in the public domain. On a Picture by Poussin by J. A. Simmons Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia 
on a picture by Poussin representing shepherds in Arcadia. Footnote. In Poussin's picture, the shepherds and the shepherdess are deciphering an almost effaced inscription on an old tomb, the words being, Et in Arcadia ego. End of footnote. Ah, happy youth, ah, happy maid, snatch present pleasure while you may, laugh, dance, and sing in sunny glade, your limbs are light, your hearts are gay, you little think there comes a day, twill come to you, it came to me, when love and life shall pass away. I too once dwelt in Arcady. Or listless lie by yonder stream, and muse and watch the ripples play, or note their noiseless flow and deem that life thus gently glides away, that love is but a sunny ray to make our years go smiling by. I knew that stream, I too could dream, I too once dwelt in Arcady. Sing, shepherd, sing, sweet lady, listen, sing to the music of the rill, with happy tears her bright eyes glisten, for as each pause the echoes fill, they waft her name from hill to hill. So listened my lost love to me, the voice she loved has long been still, I too once dwelt in Arcady. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Arrow and the Song by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Tim Chuang I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For, so swiftly it flew, the sight could not follow it in its flight. I breathed a song into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Long, long afterward, in an oak, I found the arrow, still unbroke. And the song, from beginning to end, I found again, in the heart of a friend. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Mozart Jr. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrows is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant, let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God o'erhead. Lives of great men all remind us, we can make our lives sublime, and departing leave behind us, footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone It little profits that an idle king By this still hearth among these barren crags Matched with an aged wife I meet and dole Unequal laws unto a savage race That hoard and sleep and feed and know not me I cannot rest from travel I will drink life to the lees, all times I have enjoyed greatly, 
have suffered greatly both with those that love me and alone on shore and when through scudding drifts of rainy hyades vex the dim sea i am become a name for always roaming with a hungry heart much have i seen and known cities of men and manners climates councils governments myself not least but honoured of them all and drunk delight of battle with my peers far from the ringing plains of windy troy i am part of all that i have met yet all experience is an arch wherethrough gleams that untravelled world whose margin fades for ever and for ever when i move how dull it is to pause to make an end to rust unburnished not to shine in use as though to breathe were life life piled on life were all too little and of one to me little remains but every hour is saved from that eternal silence something more a bringer of new things and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought this is my son mine own telemachus to whom i leave the sceptre and the isle well loved of me discerning to fulfil this labour by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good most blameless is he centred in the sphere of common duties decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and pay meet adoration to my household gods when i am gone he works his work i mine there lies the port the vessel puffs her sail there gloom the dark broad seas my mariners souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts free foreheads you and i are old old age hath yet his honour and his toil death closes all but something ere the end some work of noble note may yet be done not unbecoming men that strove with gods the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks the long day wanes the slow moon climbs the deep moans round with many voices come my friends tis not too late to seek a newer world push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until i die it may be that the gulfs will wash us down it may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great achilles whom we knew though much is taken much abides and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven that which we are we are one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate but strong in will to strive to seek to find and not to yield end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Farewell by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Flow down, cold rivulet, to the sea Thy tribute wave deliver No more by thee my steps shall be Forever and forever Flow softly, flow by lawn and lea A rivulet, then a river nowhere by thee my steps shall be for ever and for ever but here will sigh thine alder tree and here thine aspen shiver and here by thee will hum the bee for ever and for ever 
a thousand suns will stream on thee a thousand moons will quiver but not by thee my steps shall be for ever and for ever end of poem this recording is in the public domain break 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 by lord tennyson read for LibriVox.org by lore break 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 on the cold gray stones o sea and i would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me oh well for the fisherman's boy that he shouts with his sister at play oh well for the sailor lad that he sings in his boat on the bay and the stately ships go on to the haven under the hill but oh for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still break 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 at the foot of thy crags o sea but the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of Shalott by Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman Part 1 On either side the river lie Long fields of barley and of rye That clothe the wold and meet the sky and through the field the road runs by to many-towered Camelot. And up and down the people go, gazing where the lilies blow, round an island there below, the island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver, through the wave that runs forever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot, Four gray walls and four gray towers Overlook a space of flowers, And the silent isle embowers The Lady of Shalott. By the margin willow-veiled Slide the heavy barges trailed By slow horses, and unhailed The shallop flitteth silken-sailed Skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand? or at the casement seen her stand, or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers, reaping early, in among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerily, from the river winding clearly, down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening, whispers, "'Tis the fairy, Lady of Shalott. Part 2 There she weaves by night and day A magic web with colors gay. She has heard a whisper say, A curse is on her if she stay To look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, And so she weaveth steadily, And little other care hath she the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear. There she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirrors, magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot, or when the moon was overhead, 
came two young lovers lately wed. I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. Part 3 A bowshot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves, the sun came dazzling through the leaves, and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see, hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot, and from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather, burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed. On burnished hooves his war-horse trod. From underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror. Tira lira by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room. She saw the water lily bloom. She saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse is come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Part 4 In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning. The broad stream in his banks complaining, Heavily the low sky raining over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, Beneath a willow left afloat, And round about the prow she wrote, The Lady of Shalott. And down the river's dim expanse, Like some bold seer in a trance, Seeing all his own mischance, With a glassy countenance, Did she look to Camelot, and at the closing of the day she loosed the chain and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying, robed in snowy white, that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light, through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here, and in the lighted palace near, died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace, the Lady of Shalott. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song from the Princess by Lord Tennyson, read by Winifred Asman.
Tears, idle tears, I know not what they mean. Tears from the depth of some divine despair. Rise in the heart and gather to the eyes in looking on the happy autumn fields and thinking of the days that are no more. Fresh as the first beam glittering on a sail that brings our friends up from the underworld. Sad as the last which reddens over one that sinks with all we love below the verge. So sad, so fresh, the days that are no more. Ah, sad and strange, as in dark summer dawns, the earliest pipe of half-awakened birds, to dying ears when unto dying eyes the casement slowly grows a glimmering square. So sad, so strange, the days that are no more. Dear as remembered kisses after death, and sweet as those by hopeless fancy feigned, on lips that are for others, deep as love, deep as first love, and wild with all regret. O oh, death in life, the days that are no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Brook by Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Snow Owl The Brook I come from haunts of Coot and Hearn I make a sudden sally And sparkle out among the fern To bicker down a valley By thirty hills I hurry down Or slip between the ridges By twenty thorps a little town And half a hundred bridges till last by philip's farm i flow to join the brimming river for men may come and men may go but i go on for ever i chatter over stony ways in little sharps and trebles i bubble into eddying bays i babble on the pebbles with many a curve my banks i fret by many a field and fallow, and many a fairy foreland set with willow weed and mallow. I chatter, chatter as I flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on for ever. I wind about and in and out with here a blossom sailing and here and there a lusty trout and here and there a grayling and here and there a foamy flake upon me as i travel with many a silvery water break above the golden gravel and draw them all along and flow to join the brimming river for men may come and men may go but I go on for ever. I steal by lawns and grassy plots, I slide by hazel covers, I move the sweet forget-me-nots that grow for happy lovers. I slip, I slide, I gloom, I glance among my skimming swallows, I make the netted sunbeam dance against my sandy shallows. I murmur under moon and stars in brambly wildernesses. I linger by my shingly bars. I loiter round my cresses. And out again I curve and flow to join the brimming river. For men may come and men may go, but I go on for ever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Locksley Hall by Lord Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski. Comrades, leave me here a little, while as yet tis early morn. Leave me here, and when you want me, sound upon the bugle horn. "'Tis the place, and all around it, as of old the curlews call. 
dreary gleams about the moorland, flying over Loxley Hall. Loxley Hall that in the distance overlooks the sandy tracks and the hollow ocean ridges roaring into cataracts. Many a night from yonder ivied casement, ere I went to rest, did I look on great Orion sloping slowly to the west. Many a night I saw the Pleiades rising through the mellow shade, glitter like a swarm of fireflies tangled in a silver braid. Here about the beach I wandered, nourishing a youth sublime, with the fairy tales of silence and the long result of time. When the centuries behind me like a fruitful land reposed, when I clung to all the present for the promise that it closed, when I dipped into the future far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. In the spring a fuller crimson comes upon the robin's breast. In the spring the wanton lapwing gets himself another crest. In the spring a livelier iris changes on the burnished dove. In the spring a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. Then her cheek was pale and thinner than should be for one so young and her eyes on all my motions with a mute observance hung. And I said, My cousin, Amy, speak, and speak the truth to me. Trust me, cousin, all the current of my being sets to thee. On her pallid cheek and forehead came a colour and a light, as I have seen the rosy red flushing in the northern light. And she turned, her bosom shaken with a sudden storm of sighs, all the spirit deeply dawning in the dark of hazel eyes saying, I have hid my feelings, fearing they should do me wrong, saying, Dost thou love me, cousin? Weeping, I have loved thee long. Love took up the glass of time and turned it in his glowing hands. Every moment, lightly shaken, ran itself in golden sands. Love took up the harp of life and smote on all the chords with might, smote the chord of self that trembling passed in music out of sight. Many a morning on the moorland did we hear the copses ring, and her whisper thronged my pulses with the fullness of the spring. Many an evening by the waters did we watch the stately ships, and our spirits rushed together at the touching of the lips. Oh, my cousin shallow-hearted, oh, my Amy, mine no more. Oh, the dreary, dreary moorland, oh, the barren, barren shore. Falser than all fancy fathoms, falser than all songs have sung, puppet to a father's threat, and servile to a shrewish tongue. Is it well to wish thee happy, having known me to decline, on a range of lower feelings and a narrower heart than mine? Yet it shall be, thou shalt lower to his level day by day, what is fine within thee growing course to sympathize with Kay. As the husband is, the wife is, thou art mated with a clown, and the grossness of his nature will have weight to drag thee down. He will hold thee when his passion shall have spent its novel force, something better than his dog, a little dearer than his horse. What is this? His eyes are heavy. Think not they are glazed with wine. Go to him, it is thy duty. Kiss him, take his hand in thine. It may be my lord is weary, that his brain is overwrought. Soothe him with thy finer fancies, touch him with thy lighter thought. He will answer to the purpose, easy things to understand. Better thou wert dead before me, though I slew thee with my hand. Better thou and I were lying, hidden from the heart's disgrace, rolled in one another's arms and silent in a last embrace. Cursed be the social wants that sin against the strength of youth. Cursed be the social lies that warp us from the living truth. Cursed be the sickly forms that err from honest nature's rule. Cursed be the gold that gilds the straightened forehead of the fool. Well, tis well that I should bluster. Hadst thou less unworthy proved, would to God, for I had loved thee more than ever wife was loved. Am I mad that I should cherish that which bears but bitter fruit? I will pluck it from my bosom, though my heart be at the root. Never, though my mortal summers to such length of years should come, as the many withered crow that leads the clanging rookery home. Where is comfort in division of the records of the mind? 
Can I part her from herself and love her as I knew her kind? I remember one that perished. Sweetly did she speak and move. Such a one I do remember. Whom to look at was to love. Can I think of her as dead and love her for the love she bore? No, she never loved me truly. Love is love forevermore. Comfort, comfort scorned of devils. This is truth the poet sings. That a sorrow's crown of sorrow is remembering happier things. Drug thy memories lest thou learn it, lest thy heart be put to proof. In the dead on happy night and when the rain is on the roof. Like a dog he hunts in dreams, and thou art staring at the wall where the dying night lamp flickers and the shadows rise and fall. Then a hand shall pass before thee, pointing to his drunken sleep, to thy widowed marriage pillows, to the tears that thou wilt weep. Thou shalt hear the never, never, whispered by the phantom years, and a song from out the distance in the ringing of thine ears, and an eye shall vex thee, looking ancient kindness on thy pain. Turn thee, turn thee on thy pillow, Get thee to thy rest again. Nay, but nature brings thee solace, For a tender voice will cry, Tis a purer life than thine, A lip to drain thy trouble dry. Baby lips will laugh me down, My latest rival brings thee rest. Baby fingers, waxen touches, Press me from the mother's breast. Oh, the child too close the father, With a dearness not his due. Half is thine and half is his, It will be worthy of the two. Oh, I see the old and formal, fitted to thy petty part, with a little hoard of maxims preaching down a daughter's heart. They were dangerous guides, the feelings she herself was not exempt. Truly she had suffered. Perish in thy self-contempt. Overlive it, lower yet, be happy, wherefore should I care? I myself must mix with action, lest I wither by despair. What is that which I should turn to? Lighting upon days like these, every door is barred with gold, and opens but to golden keys. Every gate is thronged with suitors, all the markets overflow. I have but an angry fancy, what is that which I should do? I have been content to perish, falling on the foeman's ground, when the ranks are rolled in vapour and the winds are laid with sound. But the jingling of the guinea helps the hurt that honour feels, and the nations do but murmur, snarling at each other's heels. Can I but relive in sadness, I will turn that earlier page. Hide me from my deep emotion, O oh, thou wondrous mother age. Make me feel the wild pulsation that I felt before the strife, when I heard my days before me and the tumult of my life. Yearning for the large excitement that the coming years would yield, eager-hearted as a boy when first he leaves his father's field, and at night along the dusky highway near and nearer drawn, sees in heaven the light of London flaring like a dreary dawn, and his spirit leaps within him to be gone before him then, underneath the light he looks at in among the throngs of men. Men, my brothers, men, the workers, ever reaping something new, that which they have done but earnest of the things that they shall do. For I dipped into the future far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be, saw the heavens fill with commerce, argosies of magic sails, pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly veils, heard the heavens fill with shouting, and there rained a ghastly dew, from the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue, far along the worldwide whisper of the south wind rushing warm, with the standards of the peoples plunging through the thunderstorm, Till the war drum throbbed no longer, and the battle flags were furled, in the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. There the common sense of most shall hold a fretful ream in awe, and the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. So I triumphed, ere my passion sweeping through me left me dry, left me with a palsied heart, and left me with the jaundiced eye. I, to which all order festers, all things here are out of joint. Science moves but slowly, slowly, creeping on from point to point. Slowly comes a hungry people, as a lion creeping nigher, glares at one that nods and winks behind a slowly dying fire. 
Yet I doubt not through the ages one increasing purpose runs, and the thoughts of men are widened with the process of the suns. What is that to him that reaps not harvest of his youthful joys, though the deep heart of existence beat forever like a boy's? Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers, and I linger on the shore, and the individual withers, and the world is more and more. Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers, and he bears a laden breast, full of sad experience moving toward the stillness of his rest. Hark, my merry comrades call me, sounding on the bugle horn, they to whom my foolish passion were a target for their scorn. Shall it not be scorn to me to harp on such a mouldered string? I am shamed through all my nature to have loved so slight a thing. Weakness to be wroth with weakness, woman's pleasure, woman's pain. Nature made them blinder motions, bounded in a shallower brain. Woman is the lesser man, and all thy passions matched with mine, are as moonlight unto sunlight, and as water unto wine. Here at least, where nature sickens, nothing, ah, for some retreat, deep in yonder shining orient, where my life began to beat. Where in wild Maratha battle fell my father, evil starred, I was left a trampled orphan and a selfish uncle's ward. Or to burst all links of habit, there to wander far away, on from island unto island at the gateways of the day. Larger constellations burning mellow moons and happy skies, breadths of tropic shade and palms in cluster, knots of paradise. Never comes the traitor, never floats a European flag. Slides the bird o'er lustrous woodland, swings the trailer from the crag. Droops the heavy-blossomed bower, hangs the heavy-fruited tree. Summer isles of Eden lying in dark purple spheres of sea. There, methinks, would be enjoyment more than in this march of mind, in the steamship, in the railway, in the thoughts that shake mankind. There the passions cramped no longer shall have scope and breathing space. I will take some savage woman, she shall rear my dusky race. Iron-jointed, supple-sinewed, they shall dive, and they shall run, catch the wild goat by the hair, and hurl their lances in the sun. Whistle back the parrot's call, and leap the rainbows of the brooks, not with blinded eyesight poring over miserable books. Fools again the dream, the fancy, but I know my words are wild. But I count the grey barbarian lower than the Christian child. I to herd with narrow foreheads, vacant of our glorious gains, like a beast with lower pleasures, like a beast with lower pains. Mated with a squalid savage, what to me were sun or clime? I, the heir of all the ages, in the foremost files of time. I that rather held it better, men should perish one by one, than that earth should stand at gaze like Joshua's moon in Agilon. Not in vain the distant beacons, forward, forward let us range. Let the great world spin forever down the ringing grooves of change. Through the shadow of the globe we sweep into the younger day. Better fifty years of Europe than a cycle of Cathay. Mother age, for mine I knew not, help me as when life begun. Rift the hills and roll the waters, flash the lightnings, weigh the sun. Oh, I see the crescent promise of my spirit hath not set. Ancient founts of inspiration well through all my fancy yet. Howsoever these things be, a long farewell to Loxley Hall. Now for me the woods may wither, now for me the roof tree fall. Comes a vapor from the margin, blackening over heath and holt, cramming all the blast before it in its breast a thunderbolt. Let it fall on Loxley Hall, with rain or hail or fire or snow, for the mighty wind arises, roaring seaward, and I go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Charge of the Light Brigade at Balaclava by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams, your book boys. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, All in the valley of death rode the six hundred. Toward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. 
Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade! Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell. Boldly they rode, and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made! All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the light brigade. Noble six hundred. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song from the Princess by Lord Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Orlando Harris. Tears, idle tears, I know not what they mean. Tears from the depth of some divine despair rise in the heart and gather to the eyes and looking on the happy autumn fields and thinking of the days that are no more. Fresh as the first beam glittering on a sail that brings our friends up from the underworld. Sad as the last which reddens over one that sinks with all we love below the verge. So sad, so fresh, the days that are no more. Ah, sad and strange as in dark summer dawns the earliest pipe of half-awakened birds to dying ears, when unto dying eyes the casement slowly grows a glimmering square. So sad, so strange, the days that are no more. Dear as remembered kisses after death, and sweet as those by hopeless fancy feigned on lips that are for others, deep as love, deep as first love, and wild with all regret, O oh, death in life, the days that are no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org By Alan Mapstone Courage, he said, and pointed towards the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon they came unto a land In which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast the languid air did swoon, breathing like one that hath a weary dream full-faced above the valley stood the moon and like a downward smoke the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem a land of streams some like a downward smoke 
slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go and some through wavering lights and shadows broke rolling a slumberous sheet of foam below they saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land far off three mountain tops three silent pinnacles of aged snow stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops up clomb the shadowy pine above the woven copse the charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west through mountain clefts the dale was seen far inland and the yellow down bordered with palm and many a winding vale and meadow set with slender gallingale a land where all things always seem the same and round about the keel with faces pale dark faces pale against the rosy flame the mild-eyed melancholy lotus-eaters came branches they bore of that enchanted stem laden with flower and fruit whereof they gave to each but whoso did receive them and taste to him the gushing of the wave far far away did seem to mourn and rave of alien shores and if his fellow spake his voice was thin as voices from the grave and deep asleep he seemed yet all awake and music in his ears his beating heart did make they sat them down upon the yellow sand between the sun and moon upon the shore and sweet it was to dream of fatherland of child and wife and slave but evermore most weary seemed the sea weary the oar weary the wandering fields of barren foam then some one said we will return no more and all at once they sang our island home is far beyond the wave we will no longer roam end of poem this recording is in the public domain Horic Song by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Kai Bean There is sweet music here that softer falls Than petals from blown roses on the grass Or night dews on still waters between walls Of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass Music that gentlier on the spirit lies Than tired eyelids upon tired eyes Music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies. Here are cool mosses deep, and through the moss the ivies creep, and in the stream the long-leaved flowers weep, and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep. Why are we weighted upon with heaviness, and utterly consumed with sharp distress, while all things else have rest from weariness? all things have rest why should we toil alone we only toil who are the first of things and make perpetual moan still from one sorrow to another throne nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings nor steep our brows in slumber's holy balm nor hearken what the inner spirit sings there is no joy but calm why should we only toil the roof and crown of things? Lo, in the middle of the wood the folded leaf is wooed from out the bud, with winds upon the branch, and there grows green and broad and takes no care, sun steeped at noon and in the moon nightly dew-fed, and turning yellow falls and floats adown the air lo sweetened with the summer light the full juiced apple waxing over mellow drops in a silent autumn night all its allotted length of days the flower ripens in its place ripens and fades and falls and hath no toil fast rooted in the fruitful soil hateful is the dark blue sky vaulted o'er the dark blue sea death is the end of life ah why should life all labour be 
let us alone time driveth onward fast and in a little while our lips are dumb let us alone what is it that will last all things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past let us alone what pleasure can we have to war with evil is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave all things have rest and ripen toward the grave in silence ripen fall and cease give us long rest or death dark death or dreamful ease how sweet it were hearing the downward stream with half-shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half dream to dream and dream like yonder amber light which will not leave the myrrh-bush on the height to hear each other's whispered speech eating the lotus day by day to watch the crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray to lend our hearts and spirits wholly to the influence of mild-minded melancholy to muse and brood and live again in memory with those old faces of our infancy heaped over with a mound of grass two handfuls of white dust shut in an urn of brass dear is the memory of our wedded lives and dear the last embraces of our wives and their warm tears but all hath suffered change for surely now our household hearths are cold our sons inherit us our looks are strange and we should come like ghosts to trouble joy or else the island princes overbold have eat our substance and the minstrel sings before them of the ten years war in troy and our great deeds as half-forgotten things is there confusion in the little isle let what is broken so remain the gods are hard to reconcile tis hard to settle order once again there is confusion worse than death trouble on trouble pain on pain long labor unto aged breath sore task to hearts worn out by many wars and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars but propped on beds of amaranth and moly how sweet while warm airs lull us blowing lowly with half-dropped eyelid still beneath a heaven dark and holy to watch the long bright river drawing slowly his waters from the purple hill to hear the dewy echoes calling from cave to cave through the thick twined vine to watch the emerald-colored water falling through many a woven acanthus wreathed divine only to hear and see the far-off sparkling brine only to hear were sweet stretched out beneath the pine the lotus blooms below the barren peak the lotus blows by every winding creek and all day the wind breathes low with mellower tone through every hollow cave and alley lone round and round the spicy downs of yellow lotus dust is blown we have had enough of action and of motion we rolled to starboard rolled to larboard when the surge was seething free where the wallowing monster spouted his foam fountains in the sea let us swear an oath and keep it with an equal mind in the hollow lotus land to live and lie reclined on the hills like gods together careless of mankind where they lie beside their nectar and the bolts are hurled far below them in the valleys and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses girdled with the gleaming world where they smile in secret looking over wasted lands blight and famine plague and earthquake roaring deeps and fiery sands clanging fights and flaming towns and sinking ships and praying hands but they smile they find a music centered in a doleful song steaming up a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong like a tale of little meaning though the words are strong chanted from an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil sow the seed and reap the harvest with enduring toil 
storing yearly little dews of wheat and wine and oil till they perish and they suffer some tis whispered down in hell suffer endless anguish others in elysian valleys dwell resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel surely surely slumber is more sweet than toil the shore than labor in the deep mid-ocean wind and wave and oar o rest ye brother mariners we will not wonder more end of poem this recording is in the public domain crossing the bar by lord tennyson read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson sunset and evening star and one clear call for me and may there be no moaning of the bar when i put out to sea but such a tide as moving seems asleep too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home twilight and evening bell and after that the dark and may there be no sadness of farewell when i embark for though from out are born of time and place the flood may bear me far i hope to see my pilot face to face when i have crossed the bar end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Brookside by Lord Houghton. I wandered by the brookside, I wandered by the mill. I could not hear the brook flow, the noisy wheel was still. There was no burr of grasshopper, no chirp of any bird, but the beating of my own heart was all the sound I heard. I sat beneath the elm tree, I watched the long, long shade, and as it grew still longer, I did not feel afraid. For I listened for a footfall, I listened for a word. But the beating of my own heart was all the sound I heard. He came not, no, he came not. The night came on alone. The little stars sat one by one, each on his golden throne. The evening wind passed by my cheek, the leaves above were stirred. But the beating of my own heart was all the sound I heard. Fast, silent tears were flowing, when something stood behind. A hand was on my shoulder. I knew its touch was kind. It drew me nearer, nearer. We did not speak one word. For the beating of our own hearts was all the sound we heard. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Musical Instrument by Elizabeth B. Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra What was he doing? the great god Pan, down in the reeds by the river, spreading ruin and scattering ban, splashing and paddling with hoofs of a goat, and breaking the golden lilies afloat with the dragonfly on the river. He tore out a reed, the great god Pan, from the deep cool bed of the river. The limpid water turbidly ran, and the broken lilies a-dying lay, and the dragonfly had fled away ere he brought it out of the river. High on the shore sat the great god Pan, while turbidly flowed the river, and hacked and hewed as a great god can with his hard bleak steel at the patient reed, till there was not a sign of a leaf indeed to prove it fresh from the river. He cut it short, did the great god Pan, how tall it stood in the river. Then he drew the pith like the heart of a man, steadily from the outside ring and notched the poor dry empty thing in holes as he sat by the river this is the way laughed the great god pan laughed while he sat by the river the only way since gods began to make sweet music they could succeed then dropping his mouth to a hole in the reed he blew in power by the river sweet sweet Sweet, oh, Pan, piercing sweet by the river, blinding sweet, oh, great God, Pan, 
the sun on the hill forgot to die, and the lilies revived, and the dragonfly came back to dream on the river. Yet half a beast is the great god Pan, to laugh as he sits by the river, making a poet out of a man. The true gods sigh for the cost and pain, for the reed which grows never more again as a reed with the reeds in the river. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 6 by Elizabeth B. Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Nancy Beard Go from me, yet I feel that I shall stand henceforward in thy shadow. Never more alone upon the threshold of my door of individual life I shall command the uses of my soul, nor lift my hand serenely in the sunshine as before without the sense of that which I forbore. Thy touch upon the palm, the widest land, doom takes to part us, leaves thy heart in mine with pulses that beat double. What I do and what I dream include thee, as the wine must taste of its own grapes. And when I sue God for myself, he hears that name of thine, and sees within my eyes the tears of two. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 14 by Elizabeth B. Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson If thou must love me, let it be for naught except for love's sake only. Do not say, I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently, for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, and certes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed, or changed for thee, and love so wrought may be unwrought so. Neither love me for thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry, a creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby but love me for love's sake that evermore thou mayest love on through love's eternity end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet forty three by elizabeth b browning read for librivox dot org by Larry Wilson. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Home Thoughts from Abroad by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Oh, to be in England now that April's there, And whoever wakes in England sees some morning unaware That the lowest boughs and the brushwood sheaf Round the M-tree bowl are in tiny leaf, While a chaffinch sings on the orchard bough in England now. And after April, when May follows, and the white throat builds, and all the swallows. Hark, when my blossomed pear tree in the hedge leans to the field, and scatters on the clover blossoms and dewdrops at the bent spray's edge. That's the wise thrush. He sings each song twice over. 
lest you should think he never could recapture the first fine careless rapture and though the fields look rough with hoary dew all will be gay when noontide wakes anew the buttercups the little children's dower far brighter than this gaudy melon flower end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Lost Leader by Robert Browning, read for LibriVox.org by So and Kelly Park. The Lost Leader, just for a handful of silver he left us, just for a ribbon to stick in his coat, found the one gift of which fortune bereft us, lost all the other she lets us devote. They, with the gold to give, doled him out silver. So much was theirs who so little allowed. How all our copper had gone for his service, rags were they purple. His heart had been proud. We that had loved him so followed him, honored him, lived in his mild and magnificent eye, learned his great language, caught his clear accents, made him our pattern to live and to die. Shakespeare was us, Milton was for us, Burns, Shelley were with us, they watched from their graves. He alone breaks from the van and the freeman, he alone sings to the rear and the slaves. We shall march prospering, not through his presence, songs may inspirit us, not from his lyre, deeds will be done while he boasts his quiescence still bidding crouch whom the rest bade aspire blot out his name then record one lost soul more one task more declined one more footpath untrod one more devil's triumph and sorrow for angels one wrong more to men one more insult to god life's night begins let him never come back to us there would be doubt hesitation and pain forced praise on our part the glimmer of twilight never glad confident morning again best fight on well for we taught him strike gallantly menace our heart ere we master his own then let him receive the new knowledge and wait us pardoned in heaven the first by the throne this recording is in the public domain misconceptions by robert browning read for LibriVox.org by so and kelly park misconceptions this is a spray the bird clung to making it blossom with pleasure ere the high tree top she sprung to fit for her nest and her treasure oh what a hope beyond measure was the poor sprays which the flying feet hung to so to be singled out built in and sung to this is a heart the queen lent on thrilled in a minute erratic ere the true bosom she bent on made for the love's regal dilmatic oh what a fancy ecstatic was the poor heart's ere the wanderer went on loved to be safe for it Proffered to, spent on. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lost Mistress by Robert Browning. Read for LibriVox.org by So and Kelly Park. The Lost Mistress. All's over then. Does truth sound bitter as one at first believes? Hark, tis the sparrow's good night twitter about your cottage eaves. And the leaf buds on the vine are woolly. I noticed that today. One day more bursts them open filly. You know the red turns gray. Tomorrow we meet the same then, dearest. May I take your hand in mine. Mere friends are we. Well, friends the merest. Keep much that I resign. Each glance of the eye so bright and black, though I keep with heart's endeavor, your voice when you wish the snow drops back, though it stay in my soul forever. That I will but say what mere friends say, or only a thought stronger. I will hold your hand, but as long as all may, or so very little longer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Ride Together by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug I said, Then, dearest, since tis so, Since now at length my fate I know, since nothing all my love avails, Since all my life seems meant for, fails, Since this was written, and needs must be, My whole heart rises up to bless your name In pride and thankfulness. Take back the hope you gave, I claim only a memory of the same, And this beside, if you will not blame, Your leave for one more last ride with me.
My mistress bent that brow of hers, those deep dark eyes, where pride demurs when pity would be softening through, fixed me a breathing while or two, with life or death in the balance. Right! The blood replenished me again. My last thought was at least not vain. I and my mistress, side by side, shall be together, breathe and ride. So one day more am I deified. Who knows but the world may end to-night. Hush! If you saw some western cloud, all billowy bosomed, overbowed by many benedictions, suns and moons, and evening stars at once. And so, you, looking and loving best, conscious grew, your passion drew, cloud, sunset, moonrise, starshine too. Down on you, near, and yet more near, till flesh must fade, for heaven was here. Thus lent she, and lingered, joy and fear. Thus lay she a moment on my breast. Then we began to ride. My soul smoothed itself out, a long cramped scroll, freshening and fluttering in the wind. Past hopes already lay behind. What need to strive with a life awry? Had I said that, had I done this, so might I gain, so might I miss. Might she have loved me? Just as well she might have hated, who can tell? Where had I been now if the worst befell? And here we are riding, she and I. Fail I alone in words and deeds? Why all men strive, and who succeeds? We rode, it seemed my spirit flew, Saw other regions, cities new, As the world rushed by on either side. I thought, all labour, yet no less Bear up beneath their unsuccess. Look at the end of work, Contrast the petty done, the undone vast, This present of theirs with a hopeful past. I hoped she would love me. Here we ride. What hand and brain went ever paired? What heart alike conceived and dared? What act proved all its thought had been? What will but felt the fleshly screen? We ride, and I see her bosom heave. There's many a crown for who can reach. Ten lines, a statesman's life in each. The flag stuck on a heap of bones. A soldier's doing. What a tones! They scratch his name on the abbey stones. My riding is better by their leave. What does it all mean, poet? Well, your brains beat into rhythm. You tell what we felt only. You expressed you hold things beautiful the best and paste them in rhyme so side by side. "'Tis something. Nay, tis much. But then, have you yourself what's best for men? Are you, poor, sick, old, ere your time, nearer one wit your own sublime than we who never have turned a rhyme? Sing, riding's a joy. For me, I ride. And you, great sculptor, so you gave a score of years to art, her slave, and that's your Venus, whence we turn to yonder girl that fords the burn. You acquiesce, and shall I repine? What, man of music, you, grown grey with notes, and nothing else to say, is this your sole praise from a friend? Greatly his opera strains intend, but in music we know how fashions end. I gave my youth, but we ride in fine. Who knows what's fit for us? Had fate proposed bliss here, should sublimate my being? Had I signed the bond? Still one must lead some life beyond, have a bliss to die with, dim descried. This foot, once planted on the goal, this glory garland round my soul, could I descry such? Try and test! I sink back, shuddering from the quest. 
earth being so good would heaven seem best now heaven and she are beyond this ride and yet she has not spoke so long what if heaven be that fair and strong at life's best with our eyes upturned whither life's flower is first discerned we fixed so ever should so abide what if we still ride on we too with life for ever old yet new changed not in kind but in degree the instant made eternity and heaven just prove that she and i ride ride together for ever ride end of poem this recording is in the public domain Andrea del Sarto by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra The Faultless Painter But do not let us quarrel any more. No, my Lucrezia, bear with me for once. Sit down, and all shall happen as you wish. You turn your face, but does it bring your heart? I'll work, then, for your friend's friend. Never fear. Treat his own subject after his own way. Fix his own time, except to his own price, and shut the money into his small hand when next it takes mine. Will it? Tenderly? Oh, I'll content him. But tomorrow, love, I often am much wearier than you think, this evening more than usual, and it seems as if, forgive now, should you let me sit here by the window with your hand in mine and look for half an hour forth on Fiesole, both of one mind as married people use, quietly, quietly the evening through, I might get up tomorrow to my work, cheerful and fresh as ever. Let us try. Tomorrow how you shall be glad for this. Your soft hand is a woman of itself, and mine, the man's bared breast, she curls inside. Don't count the time lost, neither. You must serve for each of the five pictures we require. It saves a model. So, keep looking so. My serpentining beauty rounds on rounds. How could you ever prick those perfect ears? Even to put the pearl there. Oh, so sweet. My face, my moon, my everybody's moon, which everybody looks on and calls his and I suppose is looked on by in turn while she looks. No one's, very dear, no less. You smile? Why, there's my picture, ready-made. There's what we painters call our harmony. A common greyness silvers everything, all in a twilight, you and I alike. You, at the point of your first pride in me, that's gone, you know, but I, at every point, my youth, my hope, my art, being all toned down to yonder sober, pleasant fisole. There's the bell, clinking from the chapel top. That length of convent wall across the way holds the trees safer, huddled more inside. The last monk leaves the garden. Days decrease and autumn grows, autumn in everything. Eh? The whole seems to fall into a shape as if I saw alike my work and self, and all that I was born to be and do, a twilight piece. Love we're in God's hand. How strange now looks the life he makes us lead. So free we seem, so fettered fast we are. I feel he laid the fetter. Let it lie. This chamber, for example. Turn your head. All that's behind us. You don't understand, nor care to understand about my art, but you can hear at least when people speak. And that cartoon, the second from the door, it is the thing, love. No such things should be. Behold, Madonna. I am bold to say I can do with my pencil what I know, what I see, what at bottom of my heart I wish for, if I ever wish so deep. Do easily, too, when I say perfectly, I do not boast, perhaps yourself or judge, who listened to the legates talk last week, and just as much they used to say in France, at any rate, tis easy, all of it. No sketches first, no studies, that's long past. 
I do what many dream of all their lives. Dream? Strive to do, and agonize to do, and fail in doing. I could count twenty such on twice your fingers, and not leave this town. Who strive? You don't know how the others strive. To paint a little thing like that you smeared, carelessly passing with your robes afloat. Yet do much less. So much less, someone says. I know his name. No matter. So much less. Well, less is more, Lucretia. I am judged. There burns a truer light of God in them, in their vexed, beating, stuffed and stopped up brain, heart, or whate'er else that goes on to prompt this low-pulsed, forthright craftsman's hand of mine. Their works drop groundward, but themselves, I know, reach many a time a heaven that's shut to me, enter and take their place there, sure enough, though they come back and cannot tell the world. My works are nearer heaven, but I sit here, the sudden blood of these men. At a word, praise them, it boils, or blame them, it boils too. I, painting from myself and to myself, know what I do. I'm unmoved by men's blame, or their praise either. Somebody remarks Morello's outline there is wrongly traced, his hue mistaken. What of that? Or else rightly traced and well-ordered. What of that? Speak as they please. What does the mountain care? Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? All is silver-gray, placid and perfect with my art. The worse, I know both what I want and what might gain, and yet how profitless to know. To sigh, had I been two, another and myself, our head would have o'erlooked the world. No doubt. Yonder's a work now of that famous youth, the herb in it, who died five years ago. Tis copied, George Vasari sent it me. Well, I can fancy how he did it all, pouring his soul with kings and popes to see, reaching that heaven might so replenish him above and through his art, for it gives way. That arm is wrongly put, and there again a fault to pardon in the drawing's lines. Its body, so to speak, its soul is right. He means right, that a child may understand. Still, what an arm! And I could alter it, but all the play, the insight and the stretch, out of me, out of me. And wherefore out? Had you enjoined them on me, given me soul, we might have risen to Raphael, I and you. Nay, love, you did give all I asked, I think, more than I merit, yes, by many times. But had you, oh, with the same perfect brow and perfect eyes and more than perfect mouth, and the low voice my soul hears as a bird the fowler's pipe and follows to the snare, had you with these the same but brought a mind. Some women do so, had the mouth there urged, God and the glory, never care for gain, the present by the future, what is that? Live for fame side by side with Agnolo, Raphael is waiting, up to God, all three. I might have done it for you, so it seems. Perhaps not. All is as God overrules, beside. Incentives come from the soul's self, the rest avail not. Why do I need you? What wife had Raphael, or has Agnolo? In this world, who can do a thing will not, and who would do it cannot, I perceive. Yet the will's somewhat somewhat to the power, and thus we half men struggle. At the end, God, I conclude, compensates, punishes. For me, it is safer, if the award be strict, that I am something underrated here, poor this long while, despised to speak the truth. I dared not, do you know, leave home all day, for fear of chancing on the Paris lords. Best is when they pass and look aside, but they speak sometimes. I must bear it all. Well may they speak. That Francis, that first time, and that long festal year at Fontainebleau, I surely then could sometimes leave the ground, put on the glory, Raphael's daily wear, in that humane great monarch's golden look, one finger in his beard, or twisted, curl over his mouth's good mark that made the smile, one arm about my shoulder, round my neck, the jingle of his gold chain in my ear. 
I, painting proudly with his breath on me, all his court around him, seeing with his eyes, such frank French eyes, and such a fire of souls, profuse, my hand kept plying by those hearts, and best of all, this, this, this face beyond, this in the background, waiting on my work, to crown the issue with the last reward. A good time, was it not, my kingly days? And had you not grown restless? But I know, tis done and past. Twas right, my instinct said. Too live the life grew, golden and not grey. And I'm the weak-eyed bat no sun should tempt out of the grange whose four walls make his world. How could it end in any other way? You called me, and I came home to your heart. The triumph was to have ended there, and if I reach it ere the triumph, what is lost? Let my hands frame your face in your hair's gold, you beautiful Lucretia that are mine. Raphael did this. Andrea painted that. The Romans is the better when you pray, but still the other's virgin was his wife. Men will excuse me. I'm glad to judge both pictures in your presence. Clearer grows my better fortune, I resolve to think. For do you know, Lucretia, as God lives, said one day Agnolo, his very self, to Raphael, I've known it all these years, when the young man was flaming out his thoughts upon a palace wall for Rome to see, too lifted up in heart because of it. Friend, there's a certain sorry little scrub goes up and down our Florence, none cares how, who, were he set to plan and execute as you are, pricked on by your popes and kings, would bring the sweat into that brow of yours. To Raphael's, and indeed the arm, is wrong. I hardly dare, yet only you to see. Give the chalk here, quick, thus the line should go. Aye, but the soul, he's Raphael, rub it out. Still, all I care for, if he spoke the truth. What, he? Why, who but Michael Agnolo? Do you forget already words like those? If really there was such a chance so lost is whether you're not grateful but more pleased. Well, let me think so. And you smile indeed. This hour has been an hour. Another smile? If you would sit thus by me every night, I should work better, do you comprehend? I mean that I should earn more, give you more. See, it's settled dusk now. There's a star. Morello's gone. The watch lights show the wall. The cue owls speak the name we call them by. Come from the window, love, come in, at last, inside the melancholy little house we built to be so gay with. God is just. King Francis may forgive me. Oft at nights when I look up from painting, eyes tired out, the walls become illumined. Brick from brick, distinct, instead of mortar, fierce bright gold, that gold of his I did cement them with. Let us but love each other. Must you go? That cousin, here again, he waits outside. Must see you, you and not with me. Those loans, more gaming debts to pay, you smiled for that? Well, let smiles buy me. Have you more to spend? While hand and eye and something of a head are left me, works my wear, and what's it worth? I'll pay my fancy. Only let me sit the grey remainder of the evening out. Idle, you call it, and muse perfectly how I could paint were I but back in France. One picture, just one more. The Virgin's face, not yours this time. I want you at my side to hear them. That is my Cognolo. Judge all I do and tell you of its worth, will you? Tomorrow, satisfy your friend. I take the subjects for his corridor, finish the portrait out of hand. There, there, and throw him in another thing or two if he demurs. The whole should prove enough to pay for this same cousin's freak. Beside, what's better, and what's all I care about? Get you the thirteen scooty for the rough. Love, does that please you? Ah, but what does he, the cousin, what does he to please you more? I'm grown peaceful as old age tonight. I regret little, I would change still less. Since there my past life lies, why alter it? The very wrong to Francis.
it is true i took his coin was tempted and complied and built this house and sinned and all is said my father and my mother died of want well had i riches of my own you see how one gets rich let each one bear his lot they were born poor lived poor and poor they died and i have laboured somewhat in my time and not been paid profusely some good son paint my two hundred pictures let him try no doubt there's something strikes a balance yes you love me quite enough it seems to-night this must suffice me here what would one have in heaven perhaps new chances one more chance four great walls in the new jerusalem meted on each side by the angel's reed for leonard raphael agnolo and me to cover the first three without a wife while well, i have mine so still they overcome because there's still lucretia as i choose again the cousins whistle go my love End of poem. footnote morello is a high mountain near florence End note. this recording is in the public domain Asolando, Epilogue, by Robert Browning, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. Asolando, Epilogue At the midnight, in the silence of the sleep-time, when you set your fancies free, will they pass to where, by death, fools think, imprisoned, lo, he lies who once so loved you, whom you loved so. Pity me? Oh, to love so, be so loved, yet so mistaken what had i on earth to do with the slothful with the mawkish the unmanly like the aimless helpless hopeless did i drivel being who one who never turned his back but marched breast forward never doubted clouds would break never dreamed though right were worsted wrong would triumph held we fall to rise are baffled to fight better sleep to wake no at noonday in the bustle of man's work time greet the unseen with a cheer bid him forward breast and back as either should be strive and thrive cry speed fight on fare ever there as here end of poem this recording is in the public domain Remembrance by Emily Bronte Read for LibriVox.org by Nancy Beard Cold in the earth, and the deep snow piled above thee, Far, far removed, cold in the dreary grave, Have I forgot my only love to love thee, Severed at last by time's all-severing wave? Now when alone, do my thoughts no longer hover over the mountains on that northern shore, resting their wings where heath and fern leaves cover thy noble heart for ever, evermore? Cold in the earth, and fifteen wild Decembers from those brown hills have melted into spring. Faithful indeed is the spirit that remembers after such years of change and suffering. Sweet love of youth, forgive if I forget thee, while the world's tide is bearing me along. Other desires and other hopes beset me, hopes which obscure but cannot do thee wrong. No later light has lightened up my heaven. No second morn has ever shone for me. All my life's bliss from thy dear life was given. All my life's bliss is in the grave with thee. But when the days of golden dreams had perished, and even despair was powerless to destroy, then did I learn how existence could be cherished, strengthened, and fed without the aid of joy. Then did I check the tears of useless passion, weaned my young soul from yearning after thine, sternly denied its burning wish to hasten, 
down to that tomb already more than mine. And even yet, I dare not let it languish, dare not indulge in memory's rapturous pain, once drinking deep of that divinest anguish. How could I seek the empty world again? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Qua Cursum Ventus by A. H. Clough. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Qua Cursum Ventus. As ships becalmed at eve that lay, with canvas drooping side by side, two towers of sail at dawn of day are scarce long leagues apart descried when fell the night upsprung the breeze and all the darkling hours they plied nor dreamt but each the self-same seas by each was cleaving side by side even so but why the tale reveal of those whom year by year unchanged brief absence joined anew to feel astounded soul from soul estranged at dead of night their sails were filled and onward each rejoicing steered ah neither blame for neither willed or wist what first with dawn appeared to veer how vain on onward strain brave barks in light in darkness too through winds and tides one compass guides to that and your own selves be true but o oh, blithe breeze and o oh, great seas though never that earliest parting passed on your white plain they join again together lead them home at last one port methought alike they sought one purpose hold wherever they fare o oh, bounding breeze o oh, rushing seas at last at last unite them there end of poem this recording is in the public domain Philosophy by A. H. Clough Say not, the struggle not availeth, the labor and the wounds are vain. The enemy faints not, nor faileth, and as things have been, they remain. If hopes were dupes, fears may be liars, it may be, in yon smoke concealed. Your comrades chase, e'en now the flyers, and, but for you, possess the field. For while the tired waves, vainly breaking, seem here no painful inch to gain, far back, through creeks and inlets making, comes silent flooding in the main. And not by eastern windows only, when daylight comes, comes in the light, in front the sun climbs slow, how slowly, but westward look, the land is bright. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Courtin' by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Kerry Adams Your book voice God makes such nights all white and still Furs you can look or listen Moonshine and snow on field and hill all silence and all glisten. Zeke'll crep up quite unbeknown and peeked in through the winder, and there sot Huldy all alone, if no one nigh to hinder. A fireplace filled the room's one side with half a cord of wood in. There weren't no stoves till comfort died to bake ye to a puddin. The walnut log shot sparkles out towards the puttiest blesser, and little flames danced all about the chinny on the dresser. Again the chimbley crook necks hung, and in amongst them rusted the old queen's arm that Granther Young fetched back from Concord busted. The very room, cause she was in, seemed warm from floor to ceiling and she looked full as rosy again as the apples she was peeling 
Twas kin o' kingdom come to look on sich a blessed creature. A dog grows blushin' to a brook, ain't modester nor sweeter. He was six foot o' man, A1, clean grit and human nature. None couldn't quicker pitch a ton, nor draw a fur straighter. He'd sparked it with full twenty gals. He'd squared em, danced em, dry em, first this one and then that, by spells. All is, he couldn't love em. But long o' her his veins would run, all crinkly like curled maple. The side she breast felt full of sun, as a south slope in April. She thought no vice had such a swing as hisn in the choir. My, when he made old hundred ring, she knowed the Lord was nigher, and she'd blush scarlet right in prayer when her new meetin bonnet felt somehow through its crown a pair of blue eyes sought upon it. That night, I tell ye, she looked some. She seemed to have got a new soul, for she felt sartin sure he'd come down to her very shoe soul. She heard a foot and knowed it too, a raspin on the scraper. Ill ways to once her feelings flew like sparks in burnt up paper. He kennel littered on the mat. Some doubtful old the sickle, his heart kept going pity pat, but hern went pity zekle. And yet she gin her cheer a jerk, as though she'd wished him further, and on her apples kept to work, parin away like murder. You want to see my pa, I s'pose? Well, no, I come designin. To see my ma? She's sprinkling clothes again tomorrow's innin. To say why gals act so or so, or don't, would be presumin. Maybe to mean yes and say no comes natural to women. He stood a spell on one foot first, then stood a spell on t'other, and on which one he felt the worst. He couldn't have told you another. Says he, I'd better call again. Says she, Think likely, mister. That last word pricked him like a pin. And, well, he up and kissed her. When Ma by and by upon him slips, Holdy sought pale as ashes, all kind of smiley round the lips and teary round the lashes. For she was just the quiet kind, whose natures never vary, like streams that keep a summer mind, snow hid in January. The blood close round her heart felt glued, too tight for all expression, till mother see how Medder stood, and gin em both her blessing. Then her red come back like the tide down to the Bay of Fundy. And all I know is they was cried in meeting come next Sunday. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Christina Rossetti Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra When I'm dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me, with showers and dewdrops wet. And if thou wilt remember, and if thou wilt forget, I shall not see the shadows, I shall not feel the rain. I shall not hear the nightingale sing on, as if in pain, and dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise nor set,
Haply I may remember, and haply may forget. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An interlude by A. C. Swinburne, read for LibriVox.org by Paul Bagley. In the greenest growth of the Maytime, I rode where the woods were wet. Between the dawn and the daytime, the spring was glad that we met. There was something the season wanted, though the ways and the woods smelt sweet. The breath at your lips that panted, the pulse of the grass at your feet. You came, and the sun came after, and the green grew golden above, and the flag flowers lightened with laughter, and the meadow sweet shook with love. Your feet in the full-grown grasses moved soft as a weak wind blows. You passed me as April passes, with face made out of a rose. By the stream where the stems were slender, your bright foot paused at the sedge, it might be to watch the tender light leaves in the springtime hedge, On boughs that the sweet month blanches with flowery frost of May, It might be a bird in the branches, it might be a thorn in the way. I waited to watch you linger, with foot drawn back from the dew, Till a sunbeam straight like a finger struck sharp through the leaves at you, And a bird overheard sang, Follow, and a bird to the right sang, Here, and the arch of the leaves was hollow, And the meaning of May was clear. I saw where the sun's hand pointed, I knew what the bird's note said, By the dawn and the dewfall anointed, You were queen by the gold on your head. As the glimpse of a burnt-out ember Recalls a regret of the sun, I remember, forget, and remember what love saw done and undone. I remember the way we parted, the day and the way we met. You hoped we were both broken-hearted, and knew we should both forget. And May, with her world in flower, seemed still to murmur and smile, as you murmured and smiled for an hour. I saw you turn at the stile. A hand like a white wood blossom you lifted and waved and passed, with head hung down to the bosom and pale as it seemed at last. And the best and the worst of this is that neither is most to blame. If you've forgotten my kisses and I've forgotten your name, End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Leave Taking by A. C. Swinburne. Read for LibriVox.org by Paul Bagley. Let us go hence, my songs, she will not hear. Let us go hence together without fear. Keep silence now, for singing time is over and over all old things, and all things dear. She loves not you, nor me, as all we love her. Yea, though we sang as angels in her ear, she would not hear. Let us rise up and part, she will not know. Let us go seaward as the great winds go, full of blown sand and foam. What help is there? There is no help. For all these things are so, and all the world is bitter as a tear, And how these things are, though ye strove to show, she would not know. Let us go home, and hence she will not weep. We gave love many dreams and days to keep, Flowers without scent, and fruits that would not grow, Saying, If thou wilt, thrust in thy sickle and reap. All is reaped now. No grass is left to mow, And we that sowed, though all we fell on sleep, She would not weep. Let us go hence and rest, she will not love, She shall not hear us if we sing hereof, 
nor see love's ways how sore they are and steep. Come hence, let be, lie still, it is enough. Love is a barren sea, bitter and deep, and though she saw all heaven in flower above, she would not love. Let us give up, go down, she will not care. Though all the stars made gold of all the air, and the sea moving saw before it move, one moonflower making all the foam flowers fair. Though all those waves went over us, and drove deep down the stifling lips and drowning hair, she would not care. Let us go hence, go hence, she will not see. Singing all once more together, surely she, she too, remembering days, and words that were, will turn a little towards us, sighing. But we, we are hence, we are gone, as though we had not been there. Nay, and though all men seeing had pity on me, she would not see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Match by A.C. Swinburne, read for LibriVox.org, by Paul Bagley. If love were what the rose is, and I were like the leaf, Our lives would grow together in sad or singing weather, Blown fields or flowerful closes, green pleasure or grey grief, If love were what the rose is, and I were like the leaf. If I were what the words are, and love were like the tune, With double sound and single delight our lips would mingle, With kisses glad as birds are, that get sweet rain at noon, If I were what the words are, and love were like the tune. If you were life, my darling, and I, your love, were death, We'd shine and snow together, ere March made sweet the weather, With daffodil and starling, and hours of fruitful breath. If you were life, my darling, and I, your love, were death. If you were thrall to sorrow, and I were page to joy, We'd play for lives and seasons, with loving looks and treasons, And tears of night and morrow, and laughs of maid and boy. If you were thrall to sorrow, and I were page to joy. If you were April's lady, and I were lord in May, We'd throw with leaves for hours, and draw for days with flowers, Till day like night were shady, and night were bright like day. If you were April's lady, and I were lord in May. If you were queen of pleasure, and I were king of pain, We'd hunt down love together, pluck out his flying feather, And teach his feet a measure, and find his mouth a rein, If you were queen of pleasure, and I were king of pain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Goethe and Frederica by Henry Sedgwick Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Goethe and Frederica Wonder, O oh wonder, maiden sweet, In the fairy bower, while yet you may. See, in rapture he lies at your feet. Rest on the truth of the glorious youth. Rest for a summer day. That great clear spirit of flickering fire You have lulled a while in magic sleep, But you cannot fill his white desire. His heart is tender, his eyes are deep, his words divinely flow, but his voice and his glance are not for you. He never can be to a maiden true. Soon he will wake and go. Well, well, twere a piteous thing to chain forever that strong young wing. Let the butterfly break for his own sweet sake the gossamer threads that have bound him. Let him shed in free flight his rainbow light and gladden the world around him short is the struggle and slight is the strain such a web was made to be broken 
and she that wove it may weave again or if no power of love to bless can heal the wound in her bosom true it is but a lorn heart more or less and hearts are many and poets few so his pardon is lightly spoken end of poem this recording is in the public domain ode by a w e o'shaughnessy read for librivox dot org by ally rose we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams yet we are the movers and shakers of the world for ever it seems with wonderful deathless ditties we build up the world's great cities and out of a fabulous story we fashion an empire's glory one man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown and three with a new song's measure can trample a kingdom down we in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth built nineveh with our sighing and babel itself with our mirth and o'er through them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth for each age is a dream that is dying or one that is coming to birth end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Love Symphony by A. W. E. O'Shaughnessy Read for LibriVox.org by Ali Rose Along the garden way just now I heard the flowers speak The white rose told me of your brow The red rose of your cheek The lily of your bended head The bindweed of your hair Each looked its loveliest and said You were more than fair I went into the wood anon, and heard the wild birds sing, How sweet you were, they warbled on, piped, trilled, the selfsame thing. Thrush, blackbird, linnet, without pause, the burden did repeat, And still began again, because you were more than sweet. And then I went down to the sea, and heard it murmuring too, Part of an ancient mystery, all made of me and you. How many a thousand years ago I loved and you were sweet. Longer I could not stay and so I fled back to your feet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Linmouth by A.W.E. O'Shaughnessy Read for LibriVox.org by Ali Rose. Around my love and me the brooding hills, full of delicious murmurs, rise on high, closing upon this spot the summer fills, and over which there rules the summer sky. Behind us on the shore down there the sea roars roughly like a fierce pursuing hound, but all this hour is calm for her and me and now another hill shuts out the sound. And now we breathe the odours of the glen, and round about us are enchanted things, the bird that hath blithe speech unknown to men, the river keen that hath a voice and sings, the tree that dwells with one ecstatic thought, wider and fairer growing year by year, the flower that floweth and knoweth naught, the bee that scents the flower and draweth near, our path is here the rocky winding ledge that sheer o'erhangs the rapid shouting stream now dips down smoothly to the quiet edge where restful waters lie as in a dream the green exuberant branches overhead sport with the golden magic of the sun here quite shut out here like rare jewels shed to fright the glittering lizards as they run 
And woeful are all those mossy floors spread out beneath us in some pathless place, where the sun only reaches and outpours his smile where never a foot hath left a trace. And there are perfect nooks that have been made by the long-growing tree through some chance turn, its trunk took since transformed with scent and shade, and filled with all the glory of the fern. And tender-tinted wood flowers are seen, clear starry blooms and bells of pensive blue, that led their delicate lives there in the green. What were the world if it should lose their hue? Even o'er the rough outjutting stone that blocks the narrow way some cunning hand hath strewn, the moss in rich adornment and the rocks down there seem written thick with many a rune. And here upon that stone we rest awhile, for we can see the lovely rivers fall and wild and sweet the place is to beguile my love and keep her till i tell her all end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of a hundred great poems compiled by richard james cross